Why did you get banned on Instagram? <laughs> Actually, to be, to be fair, I don't know fully, but what, from what I did some digging and I found out there was a um, OnlyFans content creator who felt like I was pushing a narrative that goes against sex work, pornography and OnlyFans. And so she pulled some strings, managed to get it banned. I also pulled some strings, managed to get back on, but I'm sure with my big mouth, I'll get myself in trouble soon. So I'm going to make a vow and I'm glad you're here to witness it. That I'm going to try and stay out of trouble because I don't want to lose my Instagram. It's actually a really great platform. Okay. Well, we'll hope we'll see we'll see how you get on after today. Yeah. So, one of the things that I've noticed recently is this sort of widespread belief that love is, is it's toxic. Mm -hmm. Why do you think these sort of modern representations of female stories are so devoid of love? You know, looking at the Barbie movie, there's these previews of the Snow White movie mm -hmm. coming up. Rachel Ziegler, Ziegler doesn't really look like she's pro love. Mm -hmm. What do you think's going on? Well, I think the demise of marriage and long-term relationships, what that means is with relationships, a bit like when you watch a movie and the whole movie can be great, but if the ending is shit, we'll say movies are shit, that movie was awful. Similarly, if the ending is fantastic, you'll say that whole movie was great. Usually the people pushing this narrative have just come out of a negative relationship. So they define the entire course of love and the entire course of relationships by their particular ending. And if the ending was terrible, love is terrible and they label it like that. And they also like to run with the narrative that that my ex is a narcissist is their favorite phrase on the planet at the moment what that does is kind of devoid us of the responsibility in causing that toxicity blame it on someone else and then blame love as a separate entity as a cause for our pain when really it's our behaviors so the love isn't toxic it's how we behave in love and how we behave when vulnerable that creates toxicity but it's easier to just say that love is this really dangerous emotion and we should avoid it at all costs and always keep our armor up just in case love comes at us and kills us when really it's our poor decision making or our behaviors that cause love to be toxic yeah I, it's strange to me that it appears to be like a top-down narrative as well it's not just individuals rejecting love mm -hmm. it's also in movies it's yeah. in culture as well yeah, and I, I, did, I do think there is, uh, you know, there is a lot to be gained from convincing people that love is toxic and you don't need it because independence breeds more customers, whether it's on social media, whether it's on porn sites, whether it's on cosmetic surgery, independence creates customers. So I think that it makes total sense from a marketing perspective to just breed the idea that love is no longer necessary. I saw a lot of interviews from the star of Snow White where she was almost making digs at well, it's actually quite a sweet fairy tale, but, but trying to make it into digs. And I just thought, um, I'm guessing the narrative of seeing love as weak is being propagated in the culture today. I don't know yeah, I there's a, a quote from that interview. She's not going to be saved by the prince. She's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. The prince in the original movie stalked her. What, why would you sign up to a film if that's what you believe was the message behind it? I'm guessing, it, because here's what they're taking is, I'm not saying Disney movies were great for our perception of love either, but the idea of mocking connection and mocking, and let's say, for example, somebody does save you and you're in a bad position, but they do save you. Why is that so negative? If somebody's going through something and you find a partner and they help you heal and you both help each other heal, why is that a negative thing? I mean, I, 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 maybe I've got it wrong, but the, the narrative I'm getting is it's almost seen as embarrassing to fall in love when and really, it's an essential component of um, of our life. We all need it. It seems to me the advice for men suggests that falling in love makes you irrational and weak. Mm -hmm. And for women, it makes you subservient and dependent. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the opposite of what both sexes want to have, yeah. right? There's a trend of wanting women to have their own independence at the mm -hmm. moment, like more power to them. And there's a trend of wanting men to be able to stand up for themselves more mm -hmm. and love is being positioned as the antithesis of the thing that you're trying to get. Yeah. Well, love is seen as suffering. And here's the thing. There's a big difference between uh, pain and suffering. Like pain is just things that happen in our life. Like let's say the person you love passes away or you ha you can't have a baby. That that's pain. Uh, but suffering is the emotional consequences of our poor decision making. Now, if you feel like love is suffering for you, have a look at your decision making. If you're becoming weak, but if you choose wisely, be you won't see it as being weak. You'll see it 
as being uh, com- compatible and you see it as being uh, compromising. But if, And if you're becoming subservient, uh, if you choose the right person, you won't see it as a form of abuse. But if you're making poor decisions, of course, love is going to be a form of suffering. But suffering is a reminder that you made wrong choices. Yeah, I was watching this baggage claim video earlier on. She's great. And she talks about this sort of common anti-love trend Mm -hmm. among, she calls it feminists, uh, a a general disinterest in emotional connection with men. Mm -hmm. This is the sort of plague that she thinks going on at the moment. Uh I I agree. And I think it's found, um, just to kind of even out the playing field, it's also found amongst the red pill men. And um, like we spoke about before, when you feel like you can't access something, the best and quickest way to defend your ego is to pretend you don't want it. So when you feel like you're not worthy of love, and which I really think is a, a, a a manifestation of low self-esteem when you feel like you're not worthy of love the quickest and easiest way to feel worthy is to pretend love is terrible pretend love is toxic and i see this a lot in red pill men and really high like a proud feminist both cohorts tend to be people who personally probably believe that they're not desirable to the opposite gender so the only way to get rid of that feeling of uh, like being undesired is to pretend you don't desire the opposite gender so i see it both and they're almost a perfect match for each other that blue haired you know uh, feminist and that red pill guy they're almost a perfect match because they both almost have the same pathologies when it comes to their understanding of love so they're they should get together (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would yeah, be that would... a very interesting relationship yeah. to observe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I am. Um, there's this idea called the inner citadel that people retreat into. Mm-hmm. If you can't get what you want, you must teach yourself to want what you can get. Right, and that's kind of what you're describing. Yeah. You know, if I tell myself that. Uh, all women are awful, then it doesn't force me to try and get into a relationship and therefore I don't need to feel the pain of heartbreak. If I tell myself that jobs are completely pointless, then I can sit in unemployment and not be concerned about not making Mm. progress toward my goals. Exactly. But the problem with that is it prevents you from fulfilling your potential in life. Human beings are designed with the potential to love and nurture one another. And whenever we cap our potential, whether that's through, like we cap our potential physically, emotionally, psychologically, anything that involves capping our potential will lead to a slow and steady depression that will signal to yourself that you're not fulfilling your potential and it will come out and manifest as a form of depression. So when you kind of ward off love you're warding off your own full potential and therefore you will see an increase in your depression and anxiety they even find studies where women when um, they hold their partner's hand during labor they experience less pain that's how much we're designed to be in love it's actually a a pain relief it's an anti-anxiety they found loads of studies where they see uh, people that you know sleep with lots of people in a communion they sleep better they don't have any like micro awakenings in the night so we're our body craves it. Whether you psychologically convince yourself you don't want it, your body will still speak to you and tell you that you need it. So unfortunately, it doesn't work. The micro awakenings thing is really interesting. I remember yeah. learning it from Johan Hari that it's basically but, yeah. a um, it's like a measure of comfort mm. that people have in safety, right? Yeah. So um, fifteen thousand years ago, you have gone out hunting and you decide to sleep in a cave that is away from where you usually would. Yeah it's adaptive for you as this nomadic person away from home to not go into quite as deep sleep because you can't be quite as assured that this particular location is safe. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why people get such bad nights sleep in hotels. Yeah. Because even if the room is quiet and it's dark and there's no LED blinking Mm -hmm. and room service doesn't come and accidentally knock on your door, it's still not your house. And we have this inbuilt micro awakening where you just come back up the threshold of consciousness and then dip back in again. Yeah. Two things that are interesting, if you have the sound of a crackling fire or the sound of snoring dogs, Mm -hmm. both of those reduce micro-awakenings. Oh, wow. Fire would have scared away predators uh-huh. and the dogs would have been an early warning system. Oh, amazing. So, that well, I, I, I read the same thing with Johan uh, Hari's book, which is fantastic. Um, was it Lost Connections? Is that the right one? And uh, yeah, it says the same thing. Evolutionary wise, we're designed to sleep with others because that creates a sense of um, safety against predators. So, when people come to me and they have insomnia, they have depression, the first thing I ask is, What are your connections like? What is your relationships like with other people? And they convince themselves they don't want a relationship. But I do understand 
it, there's a part of me, and I've spoken about this a little bit with when I was speaking to my clients. I kind of I can understand why the lazy kind of man that feels undesirable is avoiding relationships because there's a lot of effort for very little return. When the alternative is, I can either watch pornography or I can hire an escort. Again, li- little effort and a l- maximum return. So I get from a log- logical point of view. If I'm going to spend hundreds of pounds on a day and she might not even sleep with me, I could spend half of that on an escort and she definitely will. But the goal of life is not to get sex, it's to get connection. And that's what they're trying to skip, unfortunately. Have you reflected on the rise of escorts and sex work? I think it's pretty fascinating mm-hmm. to look at the psychology of the women who do it and the men who pay for it. Yeah. Well, the women who do it usually, and I think it's probably less now, but there's a, a, a big history of childhood sexual abuse. And the reason why child abuse often then becomes monetized sex work is because when we are violated as a child, men or women, when, we, when something is violated from us, the only way your ego kind of makes sense of what happens to you is to minimize the importance and significance of what was stolen from you. So if I was abused sexually, if I then minimize the importance of sex and then take some control by monetizing it and saying, I'm now in control of my body, I'm either going to be hyper promiscuous or I'm going to monetize it. What it does is minimizes the significance of sex and therefore I don't have to deal with the trauma I experienced. I now see sex as just an activity. And therefore, if I was abused, it's not that serious. And so the psychology of them is usually coming from a broken place. And also the other thing that they struggle with is knowing what loyalty looks like in a relationship. They don't see it as an essential component because they've monetized sex and um, taken away the emotion emo- uh, element to it. So it becomes very difficult for them to be sexually loyal to their partner. It's almost like they see sex as a bit as an activity. And if they do it with somebody else, why would that bother you? They don't understand the process. So they end up being quite emotional emotionally disconnected, very transactional with their partners and the relationships become, the the relationships don't really last very long, unfortunately. They're a void of emotions and then it translates into their parenting as well. What about the psychology of the men who pay for it? Um, the psychology of the man that actually goes towards it is usually he is somebody who's highly avoidant to begin with. There was some emotional disconnect in their parents in their household. So when you got, want to court a beautiful woman in the real world, she requires some emotional connection first and foremost, or at least at some point. Now, if you if you find it hard to experience emotional connection and you have the money to go from pornography to escorts, you skip the emotional component and go straight to escorts. It basically, escorts are porn addicts with money. <laughs> yeah, essentially, that is for them. And that low self-esteem, that's intense low self-esteem um, with the men that pay for escorts means that they don't believe they can access a woman of, of that caliber in real life. So let me at least pay in for it. And therefore, I don't have to experience rejection. The reason why emotional kind of disconnect is so important for the customer is a man that understands emotional intelligence and understands a woman's emotions wouldn't feel comfortable having sex with a woman he knows doesn't want to be there. Uh, a guy that normally has emotional intelligence will think, oh God, she's probably not enjoying this. And oh God, what trauma led her to get here? I don't want to have sex with somebody who doesn't want to have sex with me. But the man who skipped that emotional in- intelligence and just wants pleasure will not even think about the emotional trauma that got her to this position and just think as long as she pleases me, I don't really care what it took to get her here. Mm. So that emotional disconnect in both of them, which is why they often fall in love with each other fall in love yeah they often do end up together and this is what i really hate about the narrative that they tell you that on these red pill podcasts that men want virgins men want good girls the amount of successful men that fall in love with the escorts is because they allow him to not emotionally connect but then still boost his ego which is what his dream come true whereas another woman requires that emotional connection before she can boost your ego so the escort is just providing him with an ego boost with bearing in mind his emotional disabilities that's interesting. Mm. I noticed. Is it? Can during, I ask? Is it big in, in America as well? Because it's huge uh, where I, I live. haven't seen it. I mean, okay. Dubai, I think, is a, a very particular uh, petri dish of, of like unique dating. Uh-huh. Maybe Miami. I mean, in Miami, fact, I would I almost imagine. be certain and with London Miami. Is, London is getting there as well. It's, getting, okay. it's just as rampant in London as well. I'm noticing that you were in all of these locations. If you move to Miami <laughs> too, you would be the common denominator. Maybe I'm the them. problem. Maybe, Maybe I, bring, I bring the heat. <laughs> so I noticed. Mm-hmm. 
when I was at uni and I was running a lot of nightclubs and we would go, oh, yeah. the only place that's open after three in the morning are the strip clubs, yeah. right? So we would go to the strip clubs and we would like, we'd know all of the girls because most of the girls would come out to one of our events on an evening time or whatever. And I noticed a lot of the girls were struggling. They would struggle to see men as like, not genuine humans, but because their job required them to see men as resources to be extracted from. Mm -hmm. Like anyone that's ever been to a proper working class strip club, mm -hmm. right? There's still, you know, like girls in there. I'm not derogating the quality of the women. <laughs> I'm talking about the kind of culture that comes yeah. through. They are fucking ruthless yeah? with how they take money from men. Oh. Like they're sitting on their lap. They, it's almost like a sales funnel. Yeah. They understand the tricks that they can use to get a man to go for a dance, to get a man to stay with you yeah. and so on and so forth. They entered the game, like the arena of play is, and if they've had too much to drink or they've mm -hmm. done whatever, like probably shouldn't have gone to the strip club with your credit card if yeah. that's the case. But what happened on the other side of that I noticed that a lot of the girls struggle to make an emotional connection with guys in their personal life. Mm -hmm. And I think that trying to separate out, this is someone that I'm supposed to have a genuine connection mm -hmm. with, and this is someone that I'm supposed to have a transactional connection with, these two, it, it doesn't surprise me that you can't, you that can't. these are gonna bleed into each other and the same has to be true with OnlyFans. Um, what happens with OnlyFans and strippers and sex workers in general, the pool of women that they're left with are men they don't respect. The reality is women respect men with masculinity, alpha, protectiveness, um, providing, etc. Now, when you go into sex work, you are left with, firstly, your customers are incredibly low self-esteem incredibly naive to even believe that you're going to be loyal to them and even if he's not your customer and he's your boyfriend but he accepts your sex work a part of you doesn't see him as powerful and a provider and doesn't see him as protective because if he was truly protective he wouldn't be with you if he was a man that genuinely was an alpha man and wanted a good woman he wouldn't be with you so the type of men they truly respect wouldn't be with them so the only men they can they, they definitely can't fall in love with the guy that is the you know giving them money the close closest thing they get to that is the pimp that's taking money from them because at least then they kind of respect the fact that he he's using her in a way but to be manipulated by her she feels more powerful than him and therefore can't respect him i wonder how many girls in strip clubs get into relationships with the bouncers yeah and the door staff yeah. and the manager and stuff like that they end up more they're just more likely to be with a man that they provide for than a one that provides for them. Because a man that provides for a stripper, there's a stupidity in that. Because you know this woman's transactional and yet you're giving her money, she can't respect you. But the man she has to pay for, whether he's like a bouncer that's on half her wage or he's just a personal trainer that she has to cover the rent for, she's more likely to fall in love with him because at least he's not stupid enough to financially invest in me. And a part of her unconsciously respects him more than the CEO that's going to buy you a house and a, a Range Rover because she's like, you're so stupid. What have you come to reflect on about the psychology of slut shaming? Um, it's a way of validating poor decision making. So when we use the word you're slut shaming, what we're really saying is stop pointing out the flaws in my flawed behavior. Essentially, we need a society filled with guilt, shame, and regret. We need to be aware of these emotions. If we remove shame from our society, and we call it f uh, fat shaming, slut shaming, essentially, we find a way of normalizing what is abnormal behavior. And when we do that, we then become reckless. We need guilt, shame, and regret to help direct us into making proper decision-making, responsible decision-making, healthy decision-making. So whenever you hear the word that's fat shaming and that's slut shaming, if the word before it is negative, then the actual, the concept is broken. We'll get back to talking to Sadia in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Element. Stop having coffee first thing in the morning. Your adenosine system that caffeine acts on isn't even active for the first 90 minutes of the day, but your adrenal system is, and salt acts on your adrenal system. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of sodium and potassium and magnesium that plays a critical role in reducing muscle cramps and fatigue whilst optimizing brain health and regulating your appetite. They are the exclusive hydration partner to Team USA weightlifting and relied on by tons of elite athletes around the world. Best of all, they have a no BS, no questions asked refund policy so you can buy it and try it all. And if you do not like it for any reason, they will give you your money back and you don't even need to return the box. That's how confident they are. 
that you love it. Head to the link in the description below or go to drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom to get a free sample pack of all eight flavors with your first box. That's drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. Yeah. Well, what would you say to the people who say, we've had a sexual revolution, Sadia. We don't need, like, girls can sleep with guys as much as they want to. Yeah. This is the new world. Get up to date now. It's 2023. Mm -hmm. Why should it be the case that that is negative, shameful, guilt-riddled behavior? Because you're the one saying that men are trash, and yet you're sleeping with them all day, every day. You're the, it's the women that sleep around the most that will say men are trash. The women in healthy relationships are not usually the ones saying that. So if this formula is working, why are you allowing trash to enter your vagina? I had an idea. Mm -hmm. I had a theory about the game theory of slut shaming mm -hmm. and the game theory of simp shaming as mm -hmm. well. I want to teach you about Okay. So mm -hmm. as far as I can see, um, more slut shaming comes from women than it does from men, mm -hmm. right? Which might be on the surface surprising, but a bit more inspection and it makes sense. Yeah. The reason that more slut shaming comes from women than it does from men mm -hmm. is because women are invested in other women not lowering the price of sex yeah. too low. Yeah. Men would happily have the price <laughs> of sex be zero, yeah. right? If you are prepared to give blowjobs on the third date, mm -hmm. but I want to wait until the fifth date, I'm yeah. also a girl, yeah. and I want to wait until the fifth date, it's in my interests okay. to raise the price of sex, yeah. right, by shaming anybody who is more sexually promiscuous mm -hmm. than I am. Yeah. So the problem that women are trying to combat is women who give sex without loyalty or resources, mm -hmm. right? They want to raise the num the amount of loyalty and resources yeah. that other women uh, use before they will give away sexual access. Mm -hmm. Now, what I realized, I think is true, men simp shame for the exact same reason in the opposite direction. Yeah. So women are concerned about sex without resources. Mm -hmm. Men are concerned with resources without sex, yeah, yeah. right? So what a simp is fundamentally doing is saying, I will give away one of the, the few things that men are supposed to hold in the highest value, yeah. which is their ability to provide. Mm -hmm. And I will give you that in return for nothing. Yeah. Right, or in return for some messages through a platform, or mm -hmm. perhaps just financially dominated or sugar babying your yes. way through college or, or traveling or whatever it is that mm -hmm. you want to do. So I feel like the energy is very similar uh, yeah, between definitely. these two simp shaming and slut shaming. Mm -hmm. Both of them are trying to ensure that competitors of the same sex don't give away the most valuable resource, mm -hmm. which they don't want to have the price of derogated too low. Absolutely. What do you think? Absolutely. It's a form of intrasexual selection, which in evolutionary psychology, it just simply means your competition within your sex. Now, the quickest and easiest way for women to kind of beat the competition is verbal aggression. And one of the things that slut shaming does is firstly, of course, like you mentioned, it reduces the value of sex. So you're competing with people who give it for free. But in addition, by slut shaming, it's our way of unconsciously trying to put other men off that woman. Now, people only slut shame attractive women you don't see if you, there are many unattractive women who are also sleeping with lots and lots of men but what happens with women they only feel the need to shame when the person is a threat in any way shape or form you will not see unattractive women get as many trolls as attractive women online and you will not get uh, unattractive women who sleep around get as many slut shaming comments as because they're seen as less of a threat. They're not a threat. So essentially what intrasexual selection does is it makes women use verbal aggression uh, against one another, but only if she's a threat. If she's not a form of threat, we actually turn it into praise because then it works to actually be friends with women because you can share breastfeeding, child rearing in evolutionary terms. Allo parenting. Yeah, but if she is any form of threat, she can potentially take your partner and take your resources. So whenever women are slut shaming and stuff, they usually focus on the women that they think that their partner would find attractive so they might not slut shame let's say for example she's an english man they might not slut shame the workers in thailand and stuff like that but they would slut shame the local only fans girls because it's more of a threat so essentially we um verbally attack those that we see as the biggest threat and that will reduce the ability of us to secure resources from a man yeah very yeah. interesting yeah, and a and sad thing as well, because I get a lot of hate from women, particularly from women, saying that I don't side with women enough. And I always just say, you have no idea what it's like to be around women. Like, I, well, maybe they do. But for me personally, I've only ever, ever experienced negativity from women, especially in the workplace. So it's hard for me to really be like, women are amazing, women empowerment, women, women, women. When we are, I know from my personal experience, we don't support each other at all. Yeah, that's... 
it's a, a ruthless sort of realization. I had Joyce Benenson on, uh, I've had Christina Durante on, mm -hmm. I've had Dr. Sarah Hill on, you know, a lot of evolutionary psychology researchers who are looking at intrasexual competition, mm -hmm. Candice Blake. And one of the things that Joyce looked at was the body language of female basketball teams. Mm -hmm. She found that male opponents showed more physical affection to each other than female compatriots. Uh -huh. So men on opposite teams of a basketball <laughs> court still nicer to each other. were more <laughs> like physically affectionate mm -hmm. than girls that were on the same team. Ah. And I think that in, there's a lot of stuff there's going on with hierarchy, how that works. Mm. It's the same reason why girls don't talk about their achievements mm. academically if they know that other people are going to find out yeah. because stepping outside of that hierarchy is something that's a little bit dangerous. And that's kind of ruthless, right? Like, it should be the case as a girl that if you succeed and do something well, that you should be able to like be proud about it and you yeah. should be able to proclaim it. And other people should say, yeah, fuck, you did good. Well yeah. done. And one of the disadvantages, men are ruthless to each other in very specific ways. Yeah. But so are women. Yeah. It was, and, and the thing is with men, they would hunt and gather in tribes. So it makes sense for them to have camaraderie and be part of a group. For women, we wouldn't necessarily use each other to go hunt. We would only feel secure once we've secured the person that gives us resources. So that's why married women tend to be, who are happily in relationships tend to be less verbally hostile to ones that are single. So single women together are, tend to be more verbally uh, hostile to one another than when those that are happily uh, spoken for because they're no longer in that competition zone. So unfortunately, Unfortunately, the reality of um, a female and female empowerment, it only works if you're not threatened by each other. The moment there's a form of threat, they become very hostile and very aggressive. And so it's very difficult to, to have a platform where you're trying to just educate people about human nature as a woman because you'll get very much a lot of hatred from other women. So it's not the easiest. Mm. What's uh, your What are your qualifications? I'm a psychologist. So what I did is I did a psychology degree, then I followed by master's. Then I actually just went into teaching. So I did, went into teaching, but then I did psychodynamic. Uh, like a dynamic diploma. So, okay. Is, yeah. psycho is psychology just not like a protected term? Do you not need to have a doctorate or something for um, that? You do if you're a research psychologist and if you're going to go into like clinical psychology. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't done a doctorate. Got I would you. like to, but it takes a long time. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Talk to me about the problem with nice guys then, talking about simps. Essentially what nice guys do is what they suffer with is not that they're too nice or anything. It's just that they have incredibly weak boundaries when it comes to women. They simply are not actually not just women. It, it could be anybody. What they do is they lack a, a lot of masculinity. And what they do is they blame the fact that they're so nice as to why they can't get women. But it's not about being nice. It's about a lack of masculinity. And one of the best ways to establish masculinity is placing boundaries, particularly with women. When you don't like a behavior, you don't roll over and allow it to continue and then give her more in order to, for you to get her. You set a boundary and you have a willingness to walk away. Nice guys, what happens is they don't like to exert their boundaries and they don't have a willingness to walk away. So what ends up happening is their nice nature becomes a reason for resentment because women don't like it. They actually feel angry when you're too nice to them because then they don't feel protected. They feel like you're weak. If you let a woman make all the decisions for you, she'll slowly start to hate you because she'll feel like she has to raise you and she'll lose respect for you. So you're better. What we truly want is not a man that just is like chaotic. We just want a man who we can trust makes good decisions. He's not the nice guy. He's the one that we'll submit to. But the one that doesn't trust his own decision making and we have to do it and he comes across as being nice, essentially he's seen as weak. Yeah, I overly pliable yeah is the term that but i think it's about hard. could you like how do you as a man make sure that you're nice and not weak like it must be difficult because in this day and age if you try and be like a bit more assertive that i'm guessing it gets a lot of pushback it's it's hard for a man how do, uh, how do i don't know i think you'd be surprised i think that you know the line of acceptable behavior is way wider than most people think mm -hmm. right you know you, you can be assertive in a powerful, reassuring way without being a tyrant. Right. It's pretty. It's pretty easy to achieve. Yeah. Right. I, I. I don't think that it's that hard. But I also understand that a lot of people don't have a massive amount of first-hand experience. Yeah. They, they're spending all of their time learning about things through the internet. Mm. They don't actually have the. You need to be skillful and nimble, right? Yeah. To be able to it, flirting and dealing with even the same sex let alone the opposite sex is like a delicate balance right it's a bit of a dance it's a bit of yeah. teasing is it too far is it too much like you know it's 
it requires experience and most people don't have the opportunity to develop and, that. And it's really easy to have the willingness to walk away when you're somebody that has a lot of alternatives and it doesn't just mean other women. It could be a lifestyle that is alternative to being settled down. But when you're somebody that doesn't have many alternatives, the willingness to walk away decreases. So I do understand it's very difficult for men to have that. But without the willingness to walk away, she'll look for a man that does have the willingness to walk away. She'll look for a man that does have boundaries because we need them as women. It's strange. And I also understand that it must be ruthless to think, oh, well, I would really like a nice guy. Maybe your last relationship was with some dude that was in very avoidant, mm -hmm. uh, in, like masculine in a non a supporting way yeah. and you think okay well I'll, I'll go for a nice guy I'll go for a guy that's a bit more pliable and a, a lot more agreeable and then if what you're saying is true and you end up resenting them mm. you go Oh, that that wasn't what I wanted either. So yeah. it must be difficult. It must be difficult for a girl. Essentially, what we truly want is a man whose decision making on his own is one that we can naturally submit to. What I mean by that is if I have to tell you to do this, that and the other and you listen to me, I don't respect you anymore. Because if I had to tell you and you listen to me and I'm better than you at making decisions, I'm more powerful than you, I don't feel protected. You simply have to be a man that could literally take a girl by a hand and lead her into uh, whatever lifestyle you is, but she feels safe in that knowledge. But if you're the type of guy I was like second guessing himself if you're second guessing yourself and then submitting to me it's a, we automatically don't find that attractive we that can't be the same for every girl though right there must be a spectrum of women it, it, it works well for women who are planning to manipulate you so the women that are planning to manipulate and planning to use a man, they love this guy without boundaries. The one that the girl that genuinely wants to have a connection with you, build a family with you, have a network with you, she actually wants you to have a backbone and wants you to have an opinion. The one that's planning to not stick around too long, the one that's planning to be with keep in touch with another guy, the guy that a girl that wants an alimony as soon as the kids arrive, that's the one that wants you to be this people pleaser, bend over backwards, do everything I say. Yeah. What about people pleasers more generally on the girl's side and on the guy's side? Well, I guess they would be a, a similar match. But what I happen with with two people pleasers, like where the woman is just a nice girl and the guys are just a nice guy, they don't create an authentic connection because neither of them are giving each other the glue or the vulnerability to attach. One saying, I'll just do what you want. The other one's, oh, okay, I'll just do what you want. We don't know each other. We're just a comfort blanket. But one of them at least has to be a bit dis disagreeable to create that connection, give you that kind of glue to attach to. So unfortunately, two people pleasers don't usually end up together did you watch succession no i didn't okay yeah. so it's pretty cool it's this series on hbo mm -hmm. and i think it's really early on maybe the one of the first few episodes in the first yeah. season and this tyrannical father is pointing at his only daughter who's just got married to a guy who's very pliable mm -hmm. at least for the first few seasons unbelievably pliable mm -hmm. right um he is a bit of a social climber that the potential future husband bit of yeah. a social climber he kind of wants to be a part of the crew so to speak uh and he says the dad is just fucking going around the room like this is something i don't like about you and this mm -hmm. is something i don't like about you and he points at shiv the daughter and he says you married a man that's beneath you because you're terrified of being betrayed oh fucking painful very but in true. that moment i saw something that's very true you know the people that are scared of losing their partner yeah. a lot of the time will date down aggressively date down yeah. because they know that they're so far ahead of what that partner would typically be in a relationship yeah. with with shiv it's largely resources and money and access which mm. is kind of strange because the dynamics flipped typically from the yeah. way it would be but um yeah that just that really and, and it's it, like one of the most brutal insults like it insults both of them at the same time with one thing <laughs> yeah. you married a man that's beneath you because you're terrified of being betrayed and it's very true a lot of women and men um uh, use that strategy but the problem is you almost guarantee the divorce if i marry someone beneath me to prevent him cheating on me that doesn't change the other aspect that is required for a healthy relationship which is bringing equal value to each other's life and when one feels like they are married beneath uh, below or it, it doesn't work out either the true connection comes when you both bring equal value and you don't and you choose to be with each other rather than you know he can't do any better or she can't do any better eventually that catches up because a person with low self-esteem who feels like they've you know been punching eventually starts to get so much low self-esteem that they might seek external validation so they might be more likely to cheat or more likely to dis uh, to betray you because at some point they can feel that you know they know that you know that you're above them and that low self-esteem can create a desire wow. to connect outside so unfortunately 
unfortunately, there isn't really a cure to that other than true connection. But one thing I would say about people pleasing, they say that it's linked to an absent father. They say that people, what has it, having a, um, a father figure does is that rough and tumble kind of play and that harsh criticism gets you in the habit of speaking truth, even if it's not the nicest thing to do. Whereas the absence of that can actually make you think that you're going to offend because it's easy to offend mum, it's harder to offend dad. So when you get in, used to that rough and tumble kind of verbal um, altercations with fathers, it prepares you for the real world of where you are less sensitive and more likely to be truthful rather than people pleasing. What about the opposite then? What about treat them mean, keep them keen as opposed to people pleasing? Um, again, another tactic um, that's very much advocated in the current dating, but is again counterproductive because the moment you treat people mean, you filter out healthy people. Healthy people don't stick around to be treated badly. That doesn't go in line with their template of relationships. Healthy people have a template of relationship that requires mutual respect. Now, when they're with somebody who treats them mean, they filter themselves out. They understand they might work on it for a little bit, but they recognize where they're not welcome. Um, when you're treating them mean, keeping them keen, you're attaching to somebody that has incredibly low self-esteem, who expects to be treated like this, who will then, when you start, when you stop playing that game and actually want to commit to that person or particularly that girl she'll become volatile she'll self-sabotage because she's so used to being treated mean commitment doesn't actually feel good it feels unfamiliar so she'll recreate some chaos in order to create the separation because treating them mean keeping them keen doesn't work unfortunately do you think men and women can be friends yes i do do you think they can be friends i've seen it go both ways Uh uh-huh more times than not, it seems to mess up, <laughs> but yeah. I, it's it's not impossible. I've got a number of friends who have managed to do that totally platonically. Mm-hmm. Do you have female friends? Do I have female <laughs> friends? I do. I do have some. Yeah, yeah, but they're mostly kind of from the industry, from podcasting. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Michaela Peterson's probably one of my closest friends on the planet. That's great. Um. Aww. Yeah. So it's some, but it's but it's. it's I think it's tough. I think it's tough. What do you think makes it tough about having female Well, just that the line between what you have and what you're familiar with when it comes to guys and girls and the line of romantic desirability is pretty fine. Mm -hmm. And it only needs to be confused by one party for the the friendship to break down, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't need both people to want it to happen. If both people want it to happen, the friendship turns into a relationship. Yeah. If one person wants it to happen, the friendship's no longer a friendship. <laughs> You're right. So right? It's just a- You've got a lot of different ways. And then let's forget that. Let's say that one of either people gets into a relationship with someone that isn't in the friendship. Yeah. Then there's like two more people that can have a problem. You yeah. can't see that person anymore. Yeah. I don't like it when you go around her house. Mm-hmm. I don't like it when you spend time with him. Mm-hmm. So there's so many different ways that yeah. this can go wrong i understand and one thing i would like to point out about that because men can never understand why females can have male friends uh, but we tend to believe that we can have male friends and the reason why we kind of think like this is because we would rather have somebody a a friend who secretly loves us than a female friend that secretly hates us and you guys don't have to experience that usually when men don't like each other they separate from each other women when they don't like each other they'll make reservations together and they'll still go on holidays together and they'll still keep in each other's lives. So when we crave male friendships, it's because you don't know the pain, well, not necessarily pain, that sounds a bit exaggerated, but the difficulty in finding good female friendships that are not as easy for us. For men, if they play a sport together, they can pretty much be friends. For us, you can do everything right with a female friendship. All it takes is, uh, you know, a birthday gone wrong or a boyfriend that they don't like or a boyfriend that they both like. Um, And the entire friendship is destroyed. And there's a safety in a male friendship that we can't find in female friendships because it's very difficult to find women that are totally not threatened by you in any way shape or form by other women and that's even when you're I'm not saying just when you're attractive even when you're less attractive you still have friends similar level of attractiveness so there is a form of threat even there Uh, so that's the first thing I think women can why women can have better friendships with men the other thing is I just think if you are a a woman or a man of value beyond your sexual kind of um, prowess if you've got something other to offer isn't it natural Natural that men, women, old, young, everybody's going to gravitate towards you and want to be around you. I just think it's natural. It's a natural consequence of being a valuable person mm. is that people gravitate towards you. In the male and female form, they will gravitate towards you. So to kind of have an arbitrary rule that you can't have male and can't have female, it would only work if your personality is limited. 
If you have a limited personality, if I'm a girl that only talks about hair and makeup, of course I can only have female friends. But if I'm a woman that can have a lot of different types of conversations, it's natural to be able to connect with different types of people. There's two things that makes me think about. First, I had the Director of Relationship Science from Hinge, Logan Uri, on the okay. show about uh, a year and a half ago. Okay. Uh, and she taught me about um, people confuse spark in the beginning of a relationship for something special mm. without realizing that some people are just sparky to everyone. Yes. And that was a really interesting insight. And it's kind of like what you're talking yeah. about here, right? That if you're somebody that's interesting and trustworthy and of high value in the world, people are just going to gravitate toward you because you're a nice person to know. Yeah. You're useful. You're cool. You're fun to be around. You're interesting, right? right? So there are certain people who just suck others in, yeah. right? Now, the second thing, have you heard of the overperception and underperception bias of attraction? Mm -hmm. So this is really interesting. It's out of evolutionary psychology. So mm -hmm. men overperceive the level of attraction that they believe women have toward them yeah. and women underperceive mm -hmm. the level of attraction that men have toward them yeah. to refer to as a failure of cross-sex mind yeah. reading and this shows up very reliably in the data david yeah. buss put this out in mm -hmm. bad men or men behaving badly depending yeah. on which country you're in this is why a boss or a co-worker will maybe make a, an ungainly move mm -hmm. apart from like the creeps like harvey weinstein and stuff mm -hmm. like that make an ungainly move because they will believe that, oh yeah, you know, her eyes always linger on me. She yeah. always makes it to the water cooler at the same time that I do. She's yeah. always in the, the, the printing her stuff in the cupboard the yeah. same time that I do as well. Maybe I should try and ask her out. Yeah. It is much more useful for men to have a smoke alarm that goes off a lot yeah. and is wrong a lot, but is right every so often. Right. Because the price of missing a potential signal is really high yeah and the cost <laughs> of noticing a signal that wasn't there is essentially zero yeah right the reverse for women mm -hmm. in speed dating they did this they put men and women down at a speed dating event asked both of them how attracted were you to the other one mm -hmm. women regularly rated that they were way less attracted to the man than the man <laughs> thought Aww. and the reverse true too yeah. this is the failure of cross-sex mind reading and mm -hmm. it explains so much about the world that men and women inhabit because we don't inhabit the same world. Mm -hmm. I don't see my interaction with you the same way that you see your interaction with me. Mm -hmm. And this reliably smeared across an entire population mm -hmm. is why men and women don't understand each other because we do not have the same brains and we don't see the world in the same way. You know, but when I do deal with uh, clients who are, you know, men who are very lonely and um, who struggle with female connection, I do ask them, do you have any female friends? And the answer is invariably no. And I always say that you need them. And they're like, no, we shouldn't be friends blah, blah, blah. men and women can't be friends and i said but they're training ground for women in the real world because when you have female friends they teach you what things upset women what things upset, make them happy what they mean by when they text slowly when they text fast when they don't text at all they teach you so much that you can't learn from women directly because when a woman is in love with a man she can't help but play stupid games because it's part of a protection strategy so what she'll do is say she's done when she's not done or say she doesn't want to sleep with you when she does mm. want to sleep with you she'll say the opposite of what she truly means but having female friends helps you understand the human psychology behind a woman in a way that experience direct experience with them won't so that's why i actually say because so many of my male friends will be like this girl just did that and i'm like oh that means she wants you to do da, da, da. And you translate you can it, see but, the code yeah, not the matrix the code because we speak in code <laughs> yeah, yeah so, well i so destiny who you should speak to at some point because I think who you guys... I think is great, by the way. Destiny's fa fascinating dude. I think dude. is fantastic. Very, very, yeah. very, very big fan of Destiny. Yeah. He said that someone asked him what the best piece of dating advice he is he, he could give to guys. And he says, during high school, have lots of female friends. Yeah. He apparently just hung with this big group of guys and girls and had tons of female friends and did exactly what you said. We'll get back to talking to Sadia in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Factor. If you are too busy this autumn to cook, but still want to make sure that you're eating well, Factor is the solution. With Factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store, plus all of the chopping and prepping and cleaning up while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality that you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat, and enjoy. And right now their autumn menu has some absolute bangers like a cranberry pecan chicken and an apple Dijon pork chop. Or if like me, you're struggling to hit your protein goals, you can try their protein plus meals with 30 grams or more of protein 
per serving. I cannot tell you how big of a life hack it is to only be two minutes away from a 30 gram of protein meal at all times. Right now, you can get 50% off by heading to the link in the description below or going to factormeals.com slash MW50 and using the code MW50 at checkout. That's factormeals.com slash MW50 and MW50 at checkout. Female friends for guys are like low stakes test relationships. Absolutely. I, I, growing up, all my friends were men and I still have a, a really large circle of male friends. My birthdays, every year, my birthday, if there's a table like this, 80% of them will be my male is friends. Is that not an Islam thing though, rather than like a friend thing? As in like why? Have... You've just, in as far as I'm aware, the typical Muslim family yeah. would have like the fucking uncles are over <laughs> and all of the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, we do have a big male dominance in our in our world. Uh, technically, we shouldn't really be interacting uh, opposite genders. I know I shouldn't be, but I do. I'll haram. be honest. I haram. <laughs> so I do, and I have a huge. And then, but the thing is, what it meant is, it's. Uh, I have a plethora of understanding about the male psyche that I could never get from a textbook. A lot of people will say to me when it comes to my content online, they say you have a very unique perspective. How you know this and I said honestly it's because I have so many males around me and I have an interest in them so I'll ask loads and loads of questions I'll understand their relationships I meet their girlfriends and I understand so it gives me up-to-date data about what's going on with men and but I am I am biased because what happens is I naturally only know men who are confident but I don't know what the psychology as much of the guy that's stuck in his mum's basement and addicted to pornography and I think I'm learning that by how triggered they get by certain conversations online so I just think it, like Destiny said, it definitely does give you a framework of understanding the male brain that you can't get through other women. That would be an unbelievably unpopular piece of advice to give to a lot of the manosphere to yeah. say that one of the best things you could do would be to be friends with women so that it's a low stakes training ground mm -hmm. for finding a, a partner down the line. Because it's kind of common advice that you don't need any women in your life. That yeah. like all you need is your boys. What could I ever get from a woman, et cetera, et cetera. There was this um, mm -hmm. massive debate. Did the sexual revolution fail mm -hmm. that happened this week in mm -hmm. LA? Mm -hmm. And one of my friends, Louise Perry, was on one of the sides. Grimes was opposite her. <laughs> uh, and Tim <laughs> Dillon was there. It was mm -hmm. mediated by Barry Weiss. And um, Rob Henderson, one of my friends, tweeted this earlier on. It's amazing. It says... There's lots of discussion at the sexual revolution debate about whether the revolution failed men or failed women or helped men more than women or helped women more than men. Nobody asked whether the sexual revolution failed children. People already know it's too depressing of a topic. Yeah, absolutely accurate. It basically failed both genders, but when you fail both genders, you fail children because they're the remnants of two broken people. So I think uh, it's massively failed children, but I think in some ways it's definitely favored the man that has no desire to invest and have responsibility. That's the only man that favors from this is he gets a bunch of women to have low enough self-esteem that they will be able to allow him access without any investment. Meanwhile, while he's getting... He he can then go on to meet the girl he actually wants to be with whilst this girl is happy to come at 4 a.m. after a night out. So it's the opposite of feminism. It's allowing men free reign over females and whilst investing very, very little. I don't know who tricked women into thinking that this is beneficial, but whoever did is probably a man. And then down the line from that, they've also managed to trick women into believing that it's fine for the guy to stay at home and play video games and make sure that the sandwiches are done all day. You can go out and earn the money. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like, it's such a trope, but people make these funny tweets online about how the patriarchy is so powerful it conned women into providing for men as well. Uh, yeah, and the other thing that I know, and I spoke about this quite recently, is the, um, ad, like, the pushing the bisexuality, which only, again, benefits... What's that? Um, I haven't heard you talk about well, this. Well, in pornography, there is a, a lot of emphasis on girl on girl, and there's a lot of threesomes and so on and so forth. And in my personal experience, seeing a lot of straight women engage in threesome activities primarily to please their, um, the man but they'll convince themselves that they like girls but they only seem to like girls in the presence of their partner that suggested the threesome and they only seem to like the girl that their partner had an insight into selecting and then and you know it's not true bisexuality because when the husband or their partner's not there they no longer have this interest in women and also when they really care about the guy they don't engage in the threesomes I know when they love the guy a lot they don't want to share him but if you were truly bisexual you wouldn't have that jealousy because you'd be like this is an equal playing field I also get to touch the girl 
But what I think that's happened is um, the rise in kind of experimenting, sexual uh, experimenting, is again only benefiting men. I know so many men that are in open relationships where he can sleep with other women, but she can't sleep with other men, but she can sleep with other women. Who benefits from that? He gets well, to, he gets to... So the presumption is that they're not actually bisexual, mm -hmm. right? It does seem, looking at some of the data, like women are more bisexual than men are, mm -hmm. uh, genuinely bisexual, at least mm -hmm. self-identifying self outside of relationships. Yeah. But yes, I would, I would agree that I was surprised with this rise of the one-sided open relationship. And the in, in Austin, there's a lot of yeah. marriages where we're open, but it's only girls and it's only when we're together. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe maybe this is what but they I, want. I would but... be curious what the data would be amongst women who have never watched porn and their level of bisexuality. I would imagine women who have never watched porn, they're bi they they have lower rates of bisexuality than women who are addicts or watch regularly I, 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 and who are partnered with men who also make the suggestion about threesomes. I would wonder how many women who without the external influences, because we've been taught for many, many years in the recent data that homosexuality and bisexuality is innate and it's something you're born with but if the advent of pornography increased it then how it must have some external forces behind it yeah well there's one of the legitimations for this is the left-handedness argument and it's used for trans people but mm -hmm. it might apply here it's kind of a useful frame so i'll tell yeah. everybody and let me spin a yarn so during the middle ages people who were left-handed were seen as being touched by the devil yeah, they were seen as being witches mm -hmm. right uh so it caused lots of people who would have been left-handed mm -hmm. to hide their left-handedness yeah. they weren't their true selves yeah as w the world began to realize that being left-handed wasn't associated with being a witch or a wizard that was relinquished and i think the percentage went from less than five to around about 12 percent of okay. the population is mm. left-handed that's they're being their true selves yeah there is an argument made that one of the reasons one of the justifications for an increase in trans youths and trans adults is that previously the judgments of society created a glass ceiling mm -hmm. that made people keep it away because mm -hmm. they were worried about being judged mm -hmm. now that the judgment has been released i'm free to be my open and, and honest self um in terms of transgender that doesn't explain the the suicide rate still being exactly the same despite the world now accepting it so there must be an underlying mental health concern that may have then be a precursor to the gender kind of not identifying it in terms of bisexuality what i would then ask is if we have now removed the stigma for bisexuality why are not more men saying to their wives can we add a man to the mix can we have it where you know you can sleep with lots of men and i can sleep with lots of men why is that not being seen as sexy why that is, is a it, strange thought why experiment are there not to consider women there saying oh can your friend come and you two do things and i just watch that doesn't happen Women are not sitting there telling their husband, can you tell your friend to come over and you two just do, I promise I won't get involved, mm. the way men do. Men are how do you think, how, so I think that, that there's definitely an asymmetry going on here Yeah. with how men see their partner, their female partner being with another female. Yeah. How do you think women would perceive their male partner being with another man? There's no going back from that. For most women, they once he's got once he's for most women. I'm not speaking of all women, but once they see the man go, because the the thing is, women when they provide each other with sexual stimulation, it's nothing really a man can't do. Also, but when a man provides another man with sexual stimulation, women can't compete with that. It's a completely different experience. So therefore, we are like you don't like. You, there's nothing I can do for you. Yeah, you're at the wrong shop here, son. You have to go back to a bit. Well, with women, I think when men are watching on other women, there's nothing that they can do to each other that they, he can't really get involved in. There's something strange. I, I don't know why, but it feels like a one-way street that goes in opposite directions. A woman that's bisexual, every man presumes that it's just a phase yeah. and that she'll go back from a liquid diet onto a solid diet eventually. <laughs> every man that's bisexual... Yeah, uh, more men that are bisexual mm -hmm. are considered to just be in the closet but have not fully committed to doing it yet yeah. and I don't know where this comes from I have no idea whether or not this is actually shown up in the data yeah. there's definitely more bisexual women and there's more gay men Yeah, I know this but I, from speaking to bisexual men they say that they, if they are bisexual they end up 
just choosing homosexuality because I know women don't really accept bisexuality in them. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so, so it's not necessarily what they want, it's what they can get. In my experience of working with bisexual men, usually the bisexuality is not always, but can be linked to some childhood sexual abuse. With childhood, And the, uh, the data also supports this. And the rates of childhood sexual abuse that leads to bisexuality in men is higher than amongst um, heterosexuals. So usually what happens is they may have experienced some abuse by... Uh, uh, somebody of the same gender. Now, what happens is, as a result of that experience, it still creates a template of sexual desire that they don't they they are open to exploring as an adult as a way of reducing the trauma. When we've been traumatized, the only way that we think we can re-untraumatize ourselves is by voluntarily like re-traumatizing ourselves. So they end up exploring a little bit or being a bit curious and stuff. But maybe they were actually heterosexual, but that trauma led them astray. And if they, they want to go back to being heterosexual, women aren't as accepting and so they end up sometimes it's just a going brutal down. um it's a brutal situation that you get into because you have to either choose to be untruthful to your partner mm -hmm. if they ever ask about exactly. your sexual history yeah. or agree to open up about something that you're fearful about how they're going to respond uh, it's kind of the, the same as the sort of one-way street of doing only fans or sex mm -hmm. work as a woman that you are going to have to concede that in future you're either going to have to tell your partner and, and deal with the potential ramifications of mm -hmm. that or you're going to have to not tell them. And when it's a partner that they accepts it and knows about it, he usually, with it, when it comes to the OnlyFans, is a poor, somebody who's addicted to pornography and it almost likes that. But the man that's addicted to pornography is very difficult for an OnlyFans woman to be with because they're usually men who still require novelty and still require more women. And so, and so it, it enhances the low self-esteem for her, unfortunately. There was this stat that I put in my newsletter this week. Involuntary childlessness is a male problem too. Mm -hmm. 25% of men over 42 do not have children, 5% more mm -hmm. than women of the same age group. Almost 40% have experienced depression, 25% feel a deep anger. There is a lot of publicity, quite rightly, about women and childlessness, but men are very mute about this. And that was in The Guardian. Oh, wow. Um, and, and I completely agree because one thing that men uh, online, their voice online to kind of shame women is, well, you don't have kids, you don't have kids. But unfortunately, who suffers more from when not when you don't have kids? What they find is women without kids and without marriage earn, I think, about 70% more than men that don't have marriage and kids because marriage and kids gives men a, a purpose and meaning that they can't derive from anything else. It gives them the motivation to work harder. It gives them the motivation to do those hard jobs that pay more. It gives them a, a, a will to live. Um, with women, we can still find connections with our friends and family and parents and we can we can spread out our connections. But if you look at most men, like if we look at your fathers and like, you know, in that generation, without their wives, they're a bit lost. I know my dad would not know what to to do with his day if my mom wasn't around and at the, as they age one of the things that doctors always say the first thing that as you as you get older and you go, go to the doctors um they'll say to you have you got a wife and even with my dad when they do a check up have you got a wife they check because why because the rate of healing after surgery is faster and quicker when you have a wife and your rate of recovery from cancer is better when you have a wife somebody checking in on you does a lot for a man because they don't get that from their social network as much as women do so a woman aging alone i'm not saying it's a good thing but it's, she's more adapted to it than a man aging alone who then starts to self-sabotage and actually kind of life becomes a slow suicide for them. I had a look at Dr. Robert Waldinger, the guy who is currently heading the longest ever longitudinal study of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and marriage seems to add about four years of oh, wow. lifespan to a man. Mm -hmm. For a woman, it's around about the same. <laughs> oh. um, so men get, you know, for all of the marriage is a terrible deal for guys. She's going to take everything in the divorce. And don't get me wrong, you know, yeah, there's a lot of divorce, terrible. and it's yeah. it's it's not great for either party. But the deal for men is really fucking good. You want to live four years longer? Like find and a partner. More and responsible more. But one thing I would say is that the family laws are so horrible in certain countries. And I'm a big advocate for marriage, but mainly because I come from a spiritual and religious background. But from a non-religious background, I can see why it seems like a death sentence to get the law involved and to get married because she can walk away with a lot, even if like she was up to blame. So I can understand where the fear comes from, but you almost have to take that risk in order to get the reward of a stable, responsible life. I think life. the risk is, is 
the risk is increasing and the reward has stayed the same. Uh, but the, the risk can be mitigated by a good selection. When you start trusting your decisions, you'll be less likely to be fearful of these consequences. But when you make poor decisions, of course, everything is a risk. Why do you think there's this generalized culture of anti children and family creation at the moment. I wonder where that's stemming from. I do think it's a sad reality. I don't know where that's coming from. I just think the reality is there's so many alternatives to having kids now. You can travel, you can really become something. If you want to become famous, you can become famous, you can travel the world, you can make a lot of money, you can do all of these things. But, you know, if you speak to people who have even, you know, scored goals in the World Cup, they'll still tell you that the best moment of their life is when their child is born. So I think it's a really negative thing to place, um, to kind of put on society i think the reality is when you know that you're going to have kids you have to take more responsibility of your life you have to save more money you have to look after your health it gives you a will to live now to remove that from you is that is a slow and steady self-sabotage when you don't have any children for the rest of your life and you think you're never going to have them essentially you could be a car wreck and no one's going to watch you whereas when you have children it's an automatic therapy you have to fix your traumas you have to fix your self-sabotaging behaviors so you're depriving yourself of reaching your full potential when you completely write that off I, I believe but I could be wrong with that I you are preaching to the choir I think yeah. that it's really great all of my friends that have become fathers they've stepped up in a way that I, I'm impressed by like they yeah. were they were hitters before and they're even bigger hitters now yeah which is why it surprises me that there is this generalized anti-children, anti-family creation culture. It's really good. Like sometimes, you know, and they even do it with men that are in like, you know, uh, in trouble with the law and stuff. Sometimes when they have children, it's the only way to get them off the streets because it's the only thing that gives them that mo motivation that they can't find outside of it. But So if you are feeling that, maybe it's uh, you need to have a kid. Down, have a kid. <laughs> well, I, I understand what you mean as well, that there is this kind of mass individualism. Mm. Um, I think that some of the most common reasons as to why people aren't getting into relationships at the moment, uh, working on myself right now, just don't feel ready, yeah. uh, sort of biding my time, so to speak. Super childish, though. It's just, mm. a, it's a focus on the individual mm. um, and it's very isolationist. It's very atomized. Mm -hmm. It's all about the individual on their own. And I, don't get me wrong, you know, if you Spend your time, maybe you're work from, working from home post-COVID. Yeah. Um, maybe your job doesn't actually require you to interact with that many other people, or maybe you're all doing it all through Slack and through Zoom. Mm -hmm. You don't need to really leave the house that much anymore. You can door dash your food. Mm -hmm. You can Amazon Prime, whatever it is that you need. You can stay on the couch and watch Netflix. Yeah. Uh, we've become more isolated, and I think that that trend almost causes us to justify more isolationism. Yeah. Uh, and... It also, it's called extended adolescence or slow mm -hmm. life strategy yeah. that Gene Twangy found. And this is just never really getting to the stage of growing up. You know, young people are getting their driver's licenses later. They're starting work later. They're moving oh. out of the house later. Mm -hmm. Like the most common living arrangement for men under the age of 30 is still being at home with their parents. Yeah, and this is one of the things I, I you know, I get a lot of slack on for online because I talk a lot about age gaps. And sometimes young women, you know, they go for older men and they'll say, yeah, but he's 40. I know I'm only 22, but at least he'll be more responsible and he will settle down. Responsibility, well, maturity is not defined by age. It's defined by how how much responsibility he has. And I always say, if he's got to 40, no kids, no marriage under his belt, he's chosen that Peter Pan lifestyle. No 23-year-old is going to come along and wake him up. He's chosen to be that man. Are you sure you want to be with him? You're better off with a 30-year-old that's got more responsibility than a 45-year-old who hasn't. Because if you think a number defines maturity, you're lost. The reality is, it's the amount of responsibility, particularly responsibility and care for others. So if he's supporting family, if he's supporting a, an ex-wife, or he was married, or he had kids it does something to men it kind of it creates a, a, a level of responsibility and accountability that they can't get without that so I do always tell women um, don't be afraid of being with a man that's had kids or a man that's uh, you know been married they're better than the ones that have had no baggage because baggage is responsibility which is then accountability for a man do you think the, the same is true in reverse? No, unfortunately. It doesn't work the same way with women. Not always. It can sometimes, but it doesn't always work the same way because women, when they have children, and good women with healthy women, actually prioritize the children first and foremost. And if she does, uh, uh, one of the priorities is becoming then super cautious of the man that she allows to enter into the man's world. And her, if she's a really good mother, she tends to keep a good co-parenting relationship with the ex and a lot of 
men don't feel comfortable with that. But the true good woman, like the single mom that you should be looking for is the one that's got a good relationship with her ex-husband. What men do is they prefer the woman that has no contact with the ex and the kids have never seen the ex. And they think, oh, I'll go for that girl. At least the baby father is not around. That's a signal that she deprives or prevents children from connecting with their father. That's not a good thing. That's not a green flag. That's actually a red flag. So what men are doing is sometimes they're selecting women and thinking she's got children, but she she doesn't let the kids see their dad and they're not in his life and he was a bum. But what does that tell you about her selection process? And what does that tell you about her ability to co-parent? It's an insight into what would happen if you two broke up. You won't exist for those children. That's not a healthy mother. A healthy mother is who cheated on me. He was awful. He was a wreck. But the kids need their father. I drop him every Friday. That's the healthy mother. But men don't interpret single motherhood the way they should. Yeah. Do you have any idea how fatherlessness impacts boys and girls' behavior and yeah. what they what they look for when they grow up and start dating? Um, with women, they definitely, here's the problem women have when they grow up without a father figure and they really feel it, is they'll always date a lot older men. So they'll be 17, 18 years old and they're looking at the 30-year-old and the 35-year-old and they're getting older and older and there's a huge gap between them. Now, in my experience of working with women that go for these age gap relationships is they are in survival mode without a father. They need that safety and comfort. And the conversations that we normally find really boring coming from our father about mortgage rates and like, you know, saving your money, they sexualize those conversations. So when they hear it from an older man, they're like, oh, he's so responsible. It's they're not used to it. So they end up initially going for that older man and falling in love. But once they feel safe and they've got the money and they've got the safety, they then look for men around their own age. They end up, it's like, it's almost like having a safe, secure base. Once you've got an older father figure in your life, then you go on to see what you're sexually attracted to. But until you've got that secure base, you're in survival mode. You're looking for who can make you feel safe, not who can make you feel who you're attracted to. So they confuse, they blur the lines between attraction and safety. And they end up looking for it in an older man, but then cheating on him with a younger man. Do you think that they over prioritize? socioeconomic status yeah. in that regard? Rightly so. I understand why, because they don't have a backup plan. When you grow up with your father, you know at some point he'll help you when things get rough or he'll leave something for you and stuff and it naturally creates a level of safety. They don't have that safety and usually they, if they come from a single mom home, she's also encouraging her to look for a rich man because it benefits her as well. Yeah, There's usually some kind of like support network, okay, you can come live with us and so on and so forth. So they come from a culture of, you know, you don't have to love a man. All men are annoying and they're difficult. So just choose one that's going to give you a good life. So they end up focusing on social economic status, but they also end up with men with low self-esteem because a man with high self-esteem at 40 years old would recognize he's got nothing in common with a 22-year-old who makes TikToks all day. He wouldn't have any intellectual intimacy. So she ends up with an older man with low self-esteem who when she does cheat on him will still take her back and so on and so forth, who, uh, who pays every bill or whatever it is. She, so she, again, she ends up with a man that she doesn't respect in the long run, but really admires initially because he provides her with that safety she's been craving. Yeah, you you told me about this book you'd been reading to do with parental alienation. Mm. What's that? Well, the thing is, I was looking into parental alienation only because I see it so much going on. But one of the things, um, punishments women use for a man that's be, that she feels has let her down is depriving her uh, him of access to the children. Now, the problem I see happening is with the children of such mothers, especially the men of such mothers, they go on to have very, very abusive relationships. So men who grow up with single moms who blocked access they end up with women who are very abusive. Either they're unfaithful or they financially abuse them or they're just, uh, they're physically abusive. They grow up with very, they end up selecting very abusive uh, women. And from my observation and from what I'm reading, it looks like what happens is when you've been deprived of a father and you've only heard mom's side of the story, what happens is they put their mom on a pedestal. They think mom's women are the innocent victims of harsh men. So what will happen is they're prey to women that need saving. They always gravitate towards women that they can save and help and nurture and say, oh yeah, that man was terrible. I've got you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you what life looks like because I've been doing that to mum my whole life. The problem with those women is they are broken beyond you. You can't fix them. Most women can't be saved. They they have an, uh, something broken that they need to fix themselves. But the man that thinks he can save her is the one that's a little bit more delusional. And he gets his self-esteem from seeing her now love him. So unfortunately, he ends up going for very broken women that end up 
re-abusing him and he uh, he ends up not having those boundaries that he needs with women so they end up in very poor relationships when they've been raised by a mother that blocks access to fathers you often hear about the reverse mm -hmm. about women who look for the guy that's broken but i can fix him and i can yeah. hold on why do you think that happens we, we hear it a lot with women it happens in men as well we hear it a lot in women because it's a huge ego boost knowing that a man used to be a player but for you he changed or he used to be in and out of jail but for you he changed here's the reality you're competing with people's childhood not other women if i've got a man that's really broken and he sleeps around and he's doing drugs or whatever it is and i think i'm going to fix him and i'm going to be the special person i'm competing with his childhood traumas you can't compete with some somebody's childhood essentially you're always going to lose now whatever caused that addictive behavior or that abusive behavior still exists before you you are not the therapist and you are not the cause of the wound so don't take on that role you're not only going to hurt yourself the best thing you can do is support them while they heal it but to attribute his healing to you as a person is a form of narcissism you're wanting to feel good by his healing not for the sake of him healing but for you to get an ego boost to know that you could do it and it's not the way to do it. I was looking at a bunch of headlines that had come out recently to do with reality TV dating shows. Yeah. What do you think are the lessons that young people are taking about love, given how many reality TV shows are to do with coupling up and breaking up and making mm. up? It's about winning. Yeah, it's all about competition. Essentially, what we've done is taken love and turned it into a game show. Now, there's no way that won't have a trickle down effect on society. What we're learning is to cheat on them before they can cheat on you. Get to cuss them more and couple up before they can do it themselves. So essentially, we're going into relationships, we're treating our partners as opponents and who can win. And the prize of this kind of competition is who can be the loneliest fastest who can create the loneliest a lonely relationship faster who can get single faster so if i cheat on you first or if i don't text back first or if i don't i win but what are you winning what's the trophy of these games the trophy is a lifetime of loneliness so um, essentially we've made the prize depression de depression is the prize of depriving yourself of love unfortunately yeah, yeah i mean you've got experience in that did you find that it became a competition while you're in there so i was pretty bored for most of my of all of my experience on love island i was also going through an existential crisis because i was faced with a bunch of people that i thought i was yeah. right i was adamant that i was this big name on campus party boy and then i go on love island and i'm faced with people who are yeah. the role that i was pretending to be yeah. and i just read paulo coelho's the alchemist as well it was like the first book i'd read in probably a decade mm -hmm. um so i was kind of in this weird I had this weird out-of-body experience for a good chunk of that time where all of these things were going on and there were storylines or whatever. And, and all I was thinking about was this guy, if anyone's not read The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, there's this young shepherd boy going on a journey of self-discovery, trying to find out who he is. And that really, really spoke to me at the time. And I was in the south coast of Mallorca, which is Spain, oh, yeah. and it was in the middle of summer. And I was I read this book during the media lockdown week and then went in in this total fucking fever dream. Yeah. Um. So my experience of Love Island, I don't think is perfectly representative. Yeah. Some of the things that I did realize were that it teaches young people that, love is a game to be played yeah that loyalty is both super important and also unbelievably disposable mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. like think about when love island comes on tv in the uk i'm team such and such yeah right like cardia yeah. or whatever like like yeah. stress like yeah. you know like whatever way that they yeah, yeah. They, they try and do that thing i'm team this and then as soon as one person decides they're going to move on typically if it's a guy he's being totally unfair mm -hmm. if it's a girl maybe that dude was a bummer if he was cute or like yeah. sweet then that was her fault and she shouldn't have done it it's so it it, it encourages people to make very quick decisions to fall very hard very fast to have loyalty but only kind of have loyalty to someone who's likable yeah. like a lot of people are un like, unlikable people deserve yeah. relationships too you know what i mean like yeah. it's everybody needs somebody yeah um yeah it's it really does it's like a popularity contest even in that 
Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, of course, of course. Because, you and know, the status... Real, do you get real emotions, like real jealousy I'd, and real anger? Or... I didn't have a single romantic emotion during Love Island. Okay. But I had a lot of bromance. No romance, but right. a lot of bromance okay. right while I was in there. I cried when I left because I was missing my boys. Oh. Like, I didn't want to leave my boys behind. Yeah. And I'd, I had this really intense emotional experience. I'd, you know, spent a lot of time. I'd really connected with guys while mm. I was there. But I... I'd, the I, girls were perfectly pleasant, but I wasn't bothered about leaving them behind. Did that affect your self-esteem in any way, that it wasn't connecting with the girls or not really? Did you just find validation? Not particularly. I just people? wasn't, I really was not attracted to any of them. Okay, so then it um, It was, well. we kept on saying when the girls were coming in, everybody had a type, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, I don't think that they'd read necessarily all of the guys' sheets. And <laughs> yeah. you can see that in the fact that there isn't a single relationship from that season. Wow, that's still not together. one. No one, no. Even no. the winners? Even the winners. No, okay. the, win the winners last like less time than anybody else. <laughs> okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. married at first sight. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this story? I, 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 I'm familiar with it. Okay. Yeah. So for the people that don't know, the transgender bride set to take married at first sight UK by storm transitioned age 21 at an NHS hospital before spending £50,000 on cosmetic surgery to be taken seriously as a woman. Mail Online can reveal today. Channel 4 viewers will see Ella Morgan, 29, who was born Evan Morgan, wed a male contestant amid a row over whether the groom was told first or not. Ms. Morgan is shown in the trailer for Married at First Sight, telling her new husband her big secret after they married, having admitted her transition has made her fear rejection after being treated as a dirty secret in the past. However, Channel 4 has now revealed that they did tell the man in advance he would be marrying a trans woman. It is understood that the man is furious with how the broadcaster treated him during the show and afterward. But the beauty and fashion consultant from Bristol says she is determined to be the star of the show to shed light on the struggles and realities of being trans, adding, we're not freaks or mentally ill. I'm still just like any other girl. Okay. Going to be difficult for you to comment on this one, Sadia. It is going to be difficult. I'm trying to see how I can behave and not offend. But here, here's the reality of it. If I was, even if I was born a woman or whatever, and I had millions of cosmetics procedures, and I have a higher risk of uh, depression because of the, you know, the lifestyle I've chosen, uh, a man has every right to know that and has every right to say it's not for me. It's not for me. I wouldn't be with a, somebody who was born a woman because it's just not for me. I'm a heterosexual woman and I'm entitled to identify as that. Now, um, what I find, the thing is, if it's really painful to be transgender and it's a lot of suffering, I don't think it's good for TV to kind of capitalize on that for views and try and use that as somebody suffering as a form of views. But I also say that it does it does make you different from other women. If you're saying the trans struggle, it was really hard for you in your childhood and you found it really depressing, that makes you different to the woman that grew up in the body she identifies with. So to say that you're on par with the typical woman is not true because you've gone through a different type of trauma that we haven't. So essentially, you're never going to be like a, a woman, not even just physically, but also psychologically. You're never going to be like a woman. And it's okay to never be like a woman. It's okay. We're, uh, the thing that I find difficult to understand about the whole trans debate is one, for many decades, we were told gender is a social construct. It's just this imaginary thing that we're telling people We've only been told that for about one decade. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. We've been told it's a, a social contract. Everybody's saying it's a social contract. The liberals are saying it's a social contract. But then if you say that you identify as the opposite gender, they give you biological treatment. Now, if it's a social construct, essentially you're only identifying as a social construct. You don't need to change your biology. It doesn't make any sense. It's like saying that your uh, football team who you support is a social construct. I don't need to change my biology to be a Man United supporter because essentially it's a social construct. So if gender is a social construct, why do we, need to transition i think the the argument on the other side of the fence would be i want my outer appearance to reflect my inner experience then why not change your inner experience rather than your outer I don't know whether they have control of that but that's no different to a, like for example an anorexic will genuinely believe that they are the fattest person in the world they identify as fat now the reality is i'm not going to give them a liposuction so that their brain and their body are aligned i have to look at the psychological defect that caused them to be unaligned and focus on the psychology first and if that doesn't work then we can look at biological procedures but the reality is i don't see how when it comes to anorexic, I get that there's, you know, self, uh, it's not healthy or whatever it is. But at the same time, we know the suicide rates in transgenders is not healthy either. We're doing them a disservice by simply giving them a shortcut to biological procedures while skipping psychological interventions. Yeah, there's, I had a Hannah Barnes on the show. She did a big 
investigation into GIDS, the gender identity something service that was at the Tavistock Clinic mm. in the UK that's recently been shut down and then kind of restarted again. And then the restart kind of, I think, had some controversy as well. And um, there is an unbelievably high percentage of autism and OCD and other sort of co-psychopathology type things mm -hmm. uh, in the trans community. And there is this big question that she asked, which was, are people mentally disturbed because they're trans or are they trans because they're mentally disturbed? Yeah. And there is a, a question to be asked that if untreated autism or OT OCD or something like that, mm -hmm. if that ended up getting treated, whether the gender dysphoria downstream from that would dissipate. Well, and that's a, I think that that would encounter in some of the real like hardline trans communities, I think that would encounter some challenges because they would say that almost by getting rid of the autism, you're denying the personhood of the trans person yeah. because it delegitimizes the gender dysphoria and almost makes it like how the light bulbs in here give off light, but also heat. It's mm. like, oh, the gender dysphoria was a side effect of autism. Yeah. And we don't know. We don't know the direction of, of causality here, but it's one of the most um, heavily contested, um, highly hot topics. Would you be uh, ostracized as a, like a, a man that chooses not to be with a transgender woman in America? Depends what you're talking about. I mean, this discussion of are you allowed to have your own preferences mm -hmm. is fascinating, mm -hmm. right? You know, if you prefer blondes mm -hmm. is that somehow prejudiced against brunettes and gingers yeah if you prefer tall girls mm -hmm. is that somehow prejudiced against petite girls like the the line between uh, the Preference question of prejudice. are you are you being either transphobic or homophobic by not dating somebody who is biologically the same sex as you but has transitioned mm -hmm. it, it's it seems like a slippery slope from there to just well, why shouldn't you date somebody that self IDs yeah. as that? You know, I don't need to do the external comparison. Do you know Blair White? You familiar with yeah, her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Blair's a good friend. Mm -hmm. I, she looks more like a girl than a lot of yeah. girls do, <laughs> yeah. right? But I don't know I, if she was to get into a relationship with somebody and not open up yeah. about, well, she hasn't had bottom surgery, so it's a, a surprise <laughs> that's waiting to visit you at some point. <laughs> yeah. It's a fascinating discussion. I do think that the, not dating transitioned people is transphobic argument has kind of been and gone. Mm -hmm. Anybody that genuinely looks at that and says, yeah, you should date how we tell you to date yeah. is it's again, like, does that mean that I have to date everybody? Yeah. Like, why do I not have to be attracted to my video guy? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm supposed to have, I'm allowed to have preferences. Yeah. And yeah, it, it becomes kind of a self-defeating. Did, did you ever hear about the study with Dr. Money and the twins? Um, so there was two twins uh, that w went to hospital to get circumcised, but they accidentally burnt the penis off one. So what the doctors decided to do is raise a child. They were both boys, but raise a child that had his penis burnt off as a woman, as a girl. So for the first seven years of life, they just put her in dresses, made her believe that she was a girl. Everything was like, you're just a girl. But as um, the girl hit, puberty she felt more and more like a boy and she, she remembering being suicidal saying I want to be a boy I feel like a boy I want to play with like the balls and I want to play sports and so eventually they told him the truth and he went back to being a boy because he just the self-discovery of your hormones but eventually he ended up committing suicide because of the trauma so the whole idea of playing with people's uh, gender especially when they do pre-puberty because that study showed that as soon as puberty hit in completely a boy again so if you try and block uh try, like a pubic like the hormones before puberty you're blocking them their self-discovery that might occur after hormones so it's quite a dangerous thing to do it's dangerous shit. yeah talking about dangerous things do you yeah. think that hot girls are more crazy always <laughs> do you think hot girls are more crazy in your experience i've well? been around quite a few hot girls but yeah. some of them can be very balanced mm. but i want give me your treatise on hot girls being crazy here's what it is with a very attractive women they don't get an insight into the average man and how average men behave they get an insight into men that are incredibly intimidated by their beauty or incredibly lustful after their beauty so they see men either kind of ignore them so the quiet good guys either just kind of intimidated by them but the loud gregarious kind of adulterous men are after them so they'll see guys that will leave their wives to be with you they'll see guys that will uh, drop everything to kind of you know even if their girlfriends in the same room they'll quickly sneak you then 
number. They'll see guys that will risk their jobs, you know, if they're your boss, to be with you. So they see men as these huge risk takers that will do anything to have sex with you. So what ends up happening is she loses her naivety about a man. She no longer thinks men are faithful. She's seen so many men break up whatever they have just to be with you and just to access you. She's seen so many men who break their back just to touch you. So what happens is when her husband now says to her, oh, I'm just, there's a new colleague at work. Her brain is like, well, every colleague at my work has always hit on me. Are you hitting on this girl? Or if, if her husband says, I'm just going to the gym, she's like, well, whenever I go to the gym, somebody hits on me. What are you doing? So they end up being suspicious because they are privy to men at their worst when they're sexually attracted to a woman. They don't have that naivety that a more plain woman would have where she could walk past a guy in a bikini and he doesn't harass her. She knows if she walks past a guy in a bikini, he drops everything. So she sees men as more dangerous than they are and therefore she thinks her partner is more sexual than he might be and as a result she tends to be more intense and crazy and less naive but not necessarily more accusatory I would say yeah Yeah. because she uses her experience about the world to predict what everybody else's experience is about the world. And in her defense, beautiful women are also, it takes a certain level of confidence and a certain level of no fear of rejection to access a beautiful girl. So her pool of men tend to be the men that are more likely to be unfaithful. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. So very attractive women are a selection effect for the kinds of experiences that they have in life, the kinds of interactions that they have with other women mm-hmm. and other men. So presumably they'll often see other women as threats. Well, they, they, well, they've experienced other women seeing them as threats and they've seen the competitive nature of women and they've seen women, because here's the thing with beautiful women. If you walk into a room with a really beautiful woman, all the other beautiful women will now start looking at you thinking, well, there must be something about, I'm sure they look at you anyway, but they would look, pay more attention because there must be something about Chris because she's unbelievable. So what ends up happening is with beautiful women start to see how disrespectful other women can be. They're looking at your man, they're, they're, they're competing with you because to get a beautiful woman's man makes the other women feel more attractive. If you walk in with an absolutely 12 out of 10 and then you give me attention, I now think I'm prettier than her. So therefore I want your attention more than the guy that's with the girl that's not that attractive. So we see this competitive nature of women. We see that we can put men, uh, uh, women can put men on the map and they see that men are very soft and they give in to beauty quite quickly and easily so they lead to a trust issue that is harder to kind of overcome so interesting yeah to the think psychology about the- of a, an attractive woman is one that is very different to a psychology of a less attractive woman they're two different species yeah, yeah. so you have women seeing other women primarily as enemies they're mm. often going to be frosty to them yeah uh, they're also kind of hyper aware of the power that they can bestow on the partner that Mm -hmm. they're with, Mm -hmm. which probably makes them a little bit tentative about giving that man that power because if they pre-select that particular type of man... You're putting him on the map. Yep. And then you also said that these women being super attractive selects for a very specific type of guy that is sufficiently confident to go up and speak to you or men will make ridiculous and wild U-turns in their Mm. life in an attempt to get to you, which also gives you a pretty unrepresentative experience of what most men are like. Yeah, and then when the looks start to fade, it's a harder transition for them. When the looks start to fade from a woman who is quite plain, she sees it as life. When the looks start to fade uh, with an attractive woman, she sees it as disastrous because a lot of the power has gone. So they might, not always, but they they might respond to it with a lot more insecurity, especially after children. But if she has good values, she recognizes that the, the looks are replaced with family connection. But if she doesn't have good values and her identity is built on her appearance, you'll see that she'll go to more and more extents to kind of um, prove her attractiveness and that might lead to promiscuity. So her identity can't be designed and around her looks. It will make her very fragile. It's rough. Being an attractive woman must be hard. Like genuinely, Mm. it must be very difficult to try and go through the world. Because with men, typically, their value to the world doesn't wax and wane Mm. in quite the same way. You know, it starts off low. Even super attractive guys will remain being attractive for a very long time. Forever. And you just have this sort of slow and steady 
increase yeah. presumably and then it'll dip out and then it'll start to even off towards um, and when it dips you don't care if it dips by that time you're so settled in life you don't care but for women it can dip a lot earlier and um they, there's a lot of talk about pretty privilege and pretty privilege this and pretty privilege that but there's lots of disadvantages and the main thing is people look for your flaws a lot more what happens when you're not attractive is people can accept what you're saying and doing and they don't really uh, delve into it but when you're attractive there's an element of other women or even men saying well i bet she's dumb well I bet she's a hoe or I bet they're looking for the negative so much more and then all they'll say I bet she's really arrogant and very vain so you almost have to work against people's negative assumptions of your character Mm. as much as they make positive assumptions of your appearance they make lots of negative assumptions about your character so you're in a bit of a battle and then it's not as easy as it might look to other people I saw what I was a model for a decade and a half Mm. in the UK and I saw a lot of the girls almost counter signal they would turn up in the most slouchy clothes that Mm. they could um you know they would purposefully wear their hair up they would purposefully wear glasses um they wouldn't wear revealing clothes Mm. they would uh try and act in ways that were um, more bookish Mm -hmm. sometimes as well and this could just be their personality it could have been the girls i was around but I also think there might be something going on here that they're trying to counter signal I am more mm. than just what I'm currently being paid for as a part of my career. Mm. I'm more than just a, yeah. a, a pretty face. I'm more than just a lingerie model. Mm-hmm. I'm more than just someone that's supposed to smile and giggle and look yeah. nice on camera. And is it hard for men to realize that they're more than that? Or is it hard for them to, like, do they, can they compartmentalize and think that she's got more it's to her? That's a good her? question. Or I would do, say... do, do, they, do they get overwhelmingly, like... Uh, attached to her appearance so there's a big difference between beauty and hotness Mm -hmm. and most models at least the ones that i was working with it wasn't sort of glamour stuff or underwear stuff that much it was you know like fashion stuff it was like cutesy editorial girl next door type thing so it was probably optimizing more for beauty than it was for hotness okay yeah Mm -hmm. um and but certainly when it comes to hotness it's a fucking reality distortion field yeah, for men right it it, and this is what we were saying this is the word that was coming to my mind as you were talking about this that the reality of a, a very very hot woman is like a sphere that follows around her just distorting all of her experiences yep. with women with men at restaurants getting into nightclubs with careers <laughs> everything yeah, the super hot, sexy woman gets it probably the worst because they activate a man's short-term mating strategies. They have long-term mating strategies with who they want a family with and short-term who they just want to mate with. And they activate that in uh, men. So a really sexy girl will activate a man's short-term mating strategies. And she'll also activate threats in women. Now, women's usual threats um, when, they, uh, when they're threatened with a woman is to go, prote- well, suggest that she's promiscuous. So they might say to, them, to the man, oh yeah, but she's really promiscuous, not realizing that actually makes her more attractive to them. Because they're like, well, I'm really looking for a short-term promiscuous. <laughs> Are you trying to sell her yeah, to me? Yeah, so they think that they're actually undermining her by saying she's so promiscuous and she's a slut and she's this, that and the other. But the man, when his short-term mating strategies are activated, that's exactly what he's looking for. So she f- ends up with men who just want short-term mating strategies. And as a result, she starts to see men as seeing disposable. And uh, therefore, it can, it can be really negative for the hot woman. Um, it does make sense about yeah. why it would be hard to have a normal... A normal mindset. I'm aware that it's easy. It's like the Pamela Anderson effect. Yeah, it's Mm. easy to throw shade. Like, are hot girls crazy? Like, it's Mm -hmm. easy to just throw shade at them. But this is why I I like these kinds of conversations because it really helps everybody to understand the experienced psychology, you know, the lived experience of somebody that's on that side of the fence. And you can say, yeah, pretty privileged, the halo effect. You know, she's getting in for free at nightclubs and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, but what if she's got zero female friends? What if she can't find a female friend that Mm -hmm. doesn't see her as an enemy, an adversary or a competitor? What if every single guy that she spends time with is terrified to speak to her or is, it's just, it's so interesting. So on the other side of the fence, do you think it's more difficult for successful or desirable men to settle down it's only difficult when they grew up without valid when they've got low self-esteem for men their success in with relationships is very much determined by their self-esteem women can get a shortcut with their appearance and so on and so forth for men their self-esteem is either going to propel them into a great relationship or uh, prevent them from any kind of stability now if he grew up without any validation and not knowing if he was attractive what happens is his self-esteem is almost um blocked at that stage of life and then he can still be a sucker to women 
and still kind of accept the unacceptable simply because he wants to be desired. But if he has good self-esteem and good boundaries, he will never suffer in relationships. He just won't because he knows when he's welcome. He knows when he's not accepted and when when the relationship's not working. And he has a willingness to walk away. So the, the thing is, money with low self-esteem is really, really difficult. It's a very lonely path. It's a lot of gold diggers. It's a lot of escorts. It's a lot of partying, even at the end, old and age. Now, money with high self-esteem and and um, good values is, I mean, it's still difficult, but you 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 can create something out of that. What about successful women? Uh, they struggle. They they really struggle because essentially, with successful women, here's the thing: men always say, "Oh, when women earn more, they leave men," but they don't realize why. There's actually studies to show that when men are with women that earn more than them, they produce more cortisol. They're actually more angry and stressed around her, and that obviously has a negative impact on their testosterone. So they're actually less sexually attracted to her, and so they're meaner to her. They're mean, and also they don't treat her the same way. If a man is dating a woman who know who knows is unemployed, say if he's on twenty thousand pounds a year, he'll still use whatever he has to treat her well like you know look after but if he's on twenty thousand pounds a year and she's on fifty thousand he use nothing to invest in her now women don't need your money but they do need your investment because that's how men fall in love the more they invest in something the more they attach to it if they invest a lot of money in a car they really care about it lost a lot of money into a bitcoin they want to see it go up invest money into a woman they want to see it work out so when they are with a woman that earns more they invest so little so walking away seems so easy for them and it seems so hard for her because she's been the one that's investing in them. So it's very difficult. It's not just the woman who's rich and now she leaves you. The man no longer adds any value. That is the main issue. He doesn't use whatever tiny resources he has on the woman like he normally would. How can people better deal with jealousy then in relationships? It's very difficult what, with, when it's activated because it comes from some childhood trauma and stuff. So it, when it's activated, that loneliness and that you know rejection is activated as it may have been as a child. And it's like the world is over when somebody's jealous. But I think in my experience of working and even my own experience of jealousy, the only thing that helps remove jealousy is really building an identity outside of the relationship. If jealous people tend to place their entire self-worth and identity on the happiness of their partner and how attracted their partner is to them and what their partner is doing. Now, the reason why that's so fragile is because your partner is fall he's a fallible person who's going to have times where they look at somebody else, they might be attracted, whatever happens, their entire identity is crushed. So to remove that jealousy, you really have to create an identity outside of the relationship, which gives you the confidence that if this relationship is great, I'm going to be in it. If it doesn't work for me, it's okay. I can go somewhere else. But that fear of letting go and fear of that they're going to find somebody else. It means that they're in a, comp a constant competition with their partner and they're almost terrified that their partner's going to meet, meet somebody else. But really, when you build your own identity, you realize if they do meet somebody else, they're no longer the person you loved anyway. So it's okay. You almost have a Zen attitude towards it, but it's very difficult. Do you, do you ever suffer with jealousy? Uh, not massively, um, but that's that's been improved by having uh more things occur in life that have uh, yeah like given me a, a more stable foundation one of the challenges i suppose is that if you get jealous you have two very difficult choices one is tell your partner mm -hmm. that can go badly that can be perceived in the wrong way or even if it's perceived in the right way it can change the way that you are perceived mm -hmm. And the other one is to just swallow it yourself and yeah. deal with it on your own, mm -hmm. which then begins to create a trend in a relationship of keeping things from your partner. But it doesn't actually stay in your side. You think you're swallowing it, but you're then manifesting it in the form of checking when they're online, checking who they're following, checking, checking, and then bursting at small things, not the real issue. So when your partner turns up late or doesn't reply to your text, then you over-exaggerate your response because that jealousy has been kept inside. So it doesn't go anywhere when you keep it in. It stays inside you. Your body keeps score of it, as they say. So the reality is by expressing it and with the right person, they'll try and help you soothe that jealousy with some reassurance. With the wrong person, they'll make you feel stupid and pathetic. Maybe you are being stupid and pathetic and they can't handle it, but they'll make you feel that way. And then the jealousy then exaggerates and increases. So it's a good test of your compatibility if you do explain it to your partner. One of the things I've been thinking about is, is almost like historical jealousy. Mm -hmm. And this is where the body count mm -hmm. conversation yeah. comes in. What have you come to believe about how much body count matters and then how can people deal with historical jealousy better? 
Well, the thing is, it's now become a big topic of debate and men are like, oh, body count, body count, body count. It's a big deal. Here's what I really say about body count. The testament of your body count is more your rejection rate than how many people you slept with. Now, if you are, let's take for, for somebody like you, for example, who's got a big name on social media, looks great, access to loads of women through the nightclub. Now, if your body count is, let's say if it's 10, but you've had hundreds of girls throwing themselves at you, yours is actually still low. Whereas if another guy who has no access to women, his... but finally gets one or two girls to sleep with him. On paper, it might be less, but his rejection rate is so low. And now instead of looking at how much how many people people sleep with, is they look at their rejection rate. Now if a girl has slept with five men or ten, 10 men, but only five or 10 men have tried to approach her, that means every man that tries gets access. But if she's a really attractive woman, she might have higher, but her rejection rate is higher. So really look at how many people you uh, the, your partner is rejecting rather than just their body count. Because on paper... A really unattractive man who has nothing going for him, his body count's going to be low. Doesn't mean he's a decent man. It's just that he didn't have the opportunity. Similarly, women that are not that nice to be around, not that kind, not that pretty, not that attractive, hers is going to be low. Doesn't mean she's virtuous. It's just that she didn't have access. It's the ones that have access but choose to be um, selective. That's what you should be looking at is their selectivity. Problem is you can't ask them the number, like how many rejections have you done in your life? Yes, you can't. That's the hard part. But what you can tell is how easily excited this person is by the opposite gender. It comes quite naturally. You can tell when people are super excited when the opposite gender pays some attention and other people are totally immune to it. That person that has a glee attached to attention is always going to maybe not have a higher body count because they you know, might not get access, but they've got more risk of um, diversion because they, they get too much ego boost from the opposite sex and not from other areas of their life. So I think body count really has to depend on the uh, the person's ability to say no to sex. It's not just how many people they slept with, but how many people can they say no to? Do I've they... never heard this frame before. I think it's very interesting. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you th- what do you think? The body it's... count. The body count conversation is is so skewed mm-hmm. because the world that we're living in now is not representative of where it would have been ten years ago or twenty years ago. But the the thing that I'm most interested in is historical jealousy. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So hearing stories about Mm. what your partner used to get up to, even if it happened once, yeah, right. And it, it's so strange. You didn't even know that they existed. You didn't know them. They didn't know you. They couldn't have said no because they were waiting for you to come. Maybe this was a one-time thing or whatever. And it triggers, especially in men, it triggers such a visceral fear, yeah, right, of inadequacy of um like jealousy but it's straight like how can you be jealous about a thing that happened before you even knew (laughs) who your partner was so yeah talk me through your conception of historical um, jealousy what happens with historical jealousy is human beings in general we prefer pain we can predict predictable pain is almost more welcome than uh, well definitely more welcome than anything unexpected now where what we do with retroactive jealousy is we hold on to the past as a way of predicting how they're going to hurt us in the future the more you're anxious you are the more you perceive threats in your environment. So what's happened with people who are jealous of the past is essentially they believe, they have a core belief that their partner is going to hurt them at some stage anyway. Now, if there's no present day evidence for that, they will look for it in the past and use that as a way of creating hypotheses of how they might hurt you in the future and therefore be mentally prepared prepared for the sabotage. Now, so essentially what they're doing is preparing themselves for the worst, but they can't find evidence. So they look for the past. And it's usually because of a fear of abandonment that they have within themselves. And it, I know it's more common in men because their fear is more stimulated by the fear of cuckoldry, that she might, histor- like evolutionary wise, it, 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 she might have a child with somebody else and pretend it's yours, that, that fear. Um, so it's ingrained in them. But m- more time that fear is activated when there's been some childhood abandonment. Or what about women? What are, what are women worried about? Uh, we're worried. We worry not as much about retro. We, we only really worry about previous exes if there is some financial or emotional investment still going on, usually when there's kids. So what happens is women tend to get jealous of the ex-wife where they've got kids and stuff like that. We get jealous of exes that are still a priority in their resources. So we're only threatened by women that have access to the resources, whether that's energy, time or money. But if it's he's not giving them that we are more worried about future threats that's interesting Mm -hmm. i imagine that must make a lot of the 
moving on, starting a new relationship as a guy that has got some history. You know, earlier on you mentioned Kids. if you're going to go for somebody that's a little bit older, it may be even in some regards a green flag mm -hmm. that they've been through some relationships and Definitely. got some baggage, yeah. you know, from that. But you also have the jealousy inclusion of the previous partner mm -hmm. and potentially the previous kid mm -hmm. resources attention so on and so forth so that must be a difficult situation to navigate a lot of women suffer from that they're really really so jealous of the ex and the children and so on and so forth and it is very difficult i can imagine it would be horrible but one thing that again if your hu husband has a good co-parenting relationship and is a good father it's a foresight into how good of a partner he will be to you and your children he prioritizes his children is really really important now a lot of women and want a man to prioritize them over their children but what kind of man is that a man that prioritizes a woman over his children what kind of man is that it's not a man you're going to be attracted to in the future especially when you have children with him because that means the next woman in his life can take that priority you need a man that prioritizes his children and it's try and see it as something you admire in him rather than jealous of him because it's a trait that's going to come in very handy when you have children with him god willing but it, uh, that guy that is just all over the place and doesn't prioritize his kids it's only handy in the short term Mm. Mm. There was a post on Instagram that I saw literally in the car on the way here. Mm. When you find out that she's unvaxxed, not a feminist, loves the Lord and aspires to be a wife, mother and homemaker, and it's Joe Rogan in the video going, oh, <laughs> like it's a, a comedy yeah. thing. And mm. the caption was, do such unicorns still exist? Mm. In the comments, people were dating. So girls were replying and saying, you know, you should come to church on a Sunday. We yeah. still exist out oh, there, wow. like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But w I, what I'm fascinated by is what is going on where unvaxxed, not a feminist, loves the Lord, aspires to be a wife, mother, and homemaker is like a counterculture finding a bar of gold hidden mm. in the sand like treasure. Uh, it is I mean, because we're so distracted by the women that aren't. The reality is that we're so um, bombarded with images of the women who are the opposite, who are the feminists, who are out there, who are not really of the Lord and don't really aspire to that. We see they're the loudest. So we see them on social media. They might be the ones that sexualize themselves a lot more. They might be the ones that put themselves out there. So what men are gravitating towards visually is going to be that filter of that kind of woman, the opposite. And the ones that are that they're ignoring visually tend to have those qualities. So here's the thing in life everything comes at a compromise now if you want somebody that will stimulate you the most sexually she's not going to be a virgin she's not going to be on church on Wednesdays she's just not going to be that girl she might be somebody who's a little bit more uh, conventional um, if you want somebody who is going to be those you might have to compromise now what's happening is because we've come, become so shallow and we value so many junk values such as uh, so many superficial things like looks when she's not beautiful you don't even pay attention to her so if she's not the most stunning girl it doesn't matter if she, what qualities have she becomes invisible a bit like with men if they're not tall a lot of women will ignore their existence, even if they've got all the other great traits. Similarly, if she's not absolutely sexy, which is what men are now attracted to, they're looking for sexy more than ever before because it's normalized, it's Instagram, it's pornography. Um, if she's not sexy, they don't even notice that woman. So that's why they think women like this are unicorns, but they are there. You just don't notice them because they don't have their boobs on your For You page. Why do you think infidelity occurs most commonly in your experience? Um, I, I would honestly say if you ever get cheated on I always I know people hate me for this but it's usually your fault and the reason I say that particularly with men uh, a cheating woman shows you every red flag from day one if you choose to ignore red flags you'll pay the price in life you pay prices there's price tax now everybody shows you that the cheaters show you they're going to be a cheat and how they show it is very simple their values they'll maybe they'll show you that they've done it in the past maybe they show you that they are are not so traditional. Maybe they show you that they are, don't believe in monogamy. Maybe they're addicted to pornography. Cheaters show you their, their past. They show you everything. Now, if you don't want to get cheated on, you either choose that cheater but know what know what the score is and then you don't get hurt or you know what's going to happen but ignoring red flags is always going to get land you in that position now whenever i have clients that have been cheated on a lot for five six years a man's got a, another mistress or three years she's been, still been talking to her ex i was like there's no way she can get to three years without your you consenting and they're like what do you mean by that i was like there would have been late replies there would have been days their phones are off there would have been not telling you where they're going they tell you everything their social media 
media would have suggested something. You would have been questioning them sometimes and they would have got defensive rather than reassuring you. They would have been signs you chose to ignore them. The price you pay for that, unfortunately, is infidelity. So you either accept an unfaithful and know what they're doing and then just decide, okay, I can accept it, but I'd rather be with you than not without you. But you, but denying the red flags is always, it's going to catch up on you. The infidelity is going to occur. So that's why people get cheated on. Why people choose to do it is because they can get a, the comfort of a relationship with the joy and pleasure of a, a, an, an alternative connection. So they get two in one. So they might get the comfort of somebody who pays the bills, but the sex life of a young personal trainer that she wants. And he might get the comfort of a good wife, but then the sex sexual experience of a escort when he goes and does that. So they, they we've become so greedy. We don't realize that some things have to involve a, a sacrifice. A healthy marriage has to involve sacrificing the alternatives. We don't see the need to sacrifice alternatives because now we are so gluttonous. Even if we eat a lot, we can still do that and get surgery. Even if we spend a lot, we can still get credit cards. We no longer see the sacrifice of alternatives as required in order for positive outcomes. Yeah, there's a a cool quote that says, uh, "There are no, there are no options, only trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Right? That for everything that you want, there is something else that mm -hmm. you need to give up." Yeah. And I think that's a good way to look at relationships. Yeah. If you want a good, healthy marriage, unfortunately, you might have to sacrifice the most exciting sexual experience every day of your life because that's what 20 years of marriage doesn't look like. You know, it's realistic. And if you want like a, a single life, then you have to accept that your emotional, like you might suffer from anxiety and depression in the long run. So you've got to realize whatever decision you make, it comes with a lot of pain and suffering. Pick your pain. Being married, the pain might involve being bored. It might not being sexual actually stimulated but being single the pain might involve a lot of loneliness depression and sadness just pick which pain you can handle and confine yourself to that decision and ward off all the alternatives what do you think about getting back together after infidelity um get back together absolutely you i don't I spit, if there's children i don't say no way no way no way if there's no children i always tell people to reconsider um but one thing i would say is different for men and women when a man forgives a female cheat she can't respect you the same way you got to remember we like alpha men alpha men don't accept promiscuity so what happens when you accept a woman back a part of her will always feel like you're weak and you don't have the willingness to walk away because there's nothing that can push a man to walk away more than infidelity. And if that didn't do it, nothing will. So now she's lawless. For a man, again, I don't rec massively recommend it unless there's children, but I would focus more on what was the meaning behind the affair? What were they seeking? And if it's something that you can do in your marriage, by all means do it. But if it's something that's more traumatic and it's more to do with an emptiness and uh, a trauma in their childhood and you can't fill that void, then you still can get back with them, but expect the behavior to continue. When I when people get back together after affair, I just say, but ask yourself, if he stayed exactly the same and still cheated five years down the line, could you be okay with it? And if you decide, you know what, I can, as long as you're good to me and good to the kids, I can do it. <clears throat> By all means, do it. But don't go back together expecting it to be completely different. It's not, it's not realistic. Interesting to think that one of the considerations that you're focusing on to do with infidelity is not whether the person can accept that themselves, mm -hmm. it's whether the other person can accept being accepted, mm -hmm. especially for women. Yes, it, it, so essentially, can you accept worst case scenario? If worst case scenario happens again, can you accept it? If the answer is no, then you're just delaying the divorce. Just do it now. If the answer is yeah, because the alternative, I just don't want to do it, then go ahead. But always ask yourself, can I accept worst case scenario? Then if that happens, at least you're prepared for it. If it doesn't happen, at least your marriage stands a shot. It's a brutal realization, I guess, for guys that maybe their partner may have had infidelity and then they can try and do the work to be able to accept them again. But that is creating a rhythm, a vibe that may make it difficult for the partner that cheated on them to, love to them. accept them yeah. back again. Yeah, they, yeah, something dies in us when we, you accept the unacceptable because your masculinity is depleted. And the other thing is the man loses his masculinity. He starts to hate himself for not being able to walk away. Instead of having a pride of attached to like, okay, I've kept my family together. They know they shouldn't do it. There's something that speaks to them. So they end up hating themselves. And because they can't always express that, they can get quite hostile and violent towards a woman and can get quite verbally abusive towards her. Mm. And and I'm not saying she's like an angel, 
but the verbal abuse and it's uh, all you're doing is uh, like i said you're just essentially uh, punishing her for your inability to walk away she's going to beg and say please forgive me please forgive me but the reality is um we don't want the man that forgives us we really don't we want the man that says you had your chance it's been a pleasure i wish you the best because that's the man we respect why do married women cheat um, a lot of married women, a couple of reasons. They didn't marry the person they truly wanted to marry. They, the uh, biological clock hit them, and they married who was available at the time. And they might have had an ex that they idolized. They might have had a, a something else. So they didn't marry correctly. They didn't choose the person that they wanted to marry. They chose the person who wanted to marry them. And so they settled to begin with. So they started wrong, and that can happen. On the alternative side, it could be is when she hasn't felt desired for a really long time. And she puts the feeling of needing to feel desired and sexy and attractive as a number one like uh, emotion. So she'll put that over and above her family and she craves that. So if she's naturally born like quite uh, attention seeking or if she married who, who wanted to marry her rather than who she truly wanted to marry, unfortunately, she's more prone to cheating. Yeah. And and you, and also if she grew up with a bit of chaos, uh, I find that women that come from single parent homes are far more likely to cheat. And the reason I, I've noticed that and the, uh, the only hypothesis I can think of is that usually when somebody isn't fulfilling our needs, we can go back to a safe haven of two. We're designed to have two parents that love us. We've got mom and dad. Two people love us. That's how it should be. Now, when those two people, one of them is absent, you always feel like there's a void. So when you're in a relationship and all of it is on him, him, if he stops giving you that love, you almost seek it as a backup because you don't want that emptiness that you may have experienced as a child. So they almost have a backup before they can leave the guy. They can't just leave and be by themselves because that really feels lonely. They'd rather leave when they've got somebody else. It's like having that extra parent in your life. You, you Like when you have mom, that noisy, you've always got dad. You've got a backup. But when you didn't grow up with that, that being by yourself is really horrible and lonesome. So they always, if one person's lets them down, they always try and keep a backup in case that person removes their love from them. It's a safety hat. Safety hatch, yeah. yeah. What about men? Why do men cheat? Um, men usually cheat when they're chasing an ego boost. They're not usually in love with the person that they're cheating with, but they are in love with the feeling that person gives them. And sometimes the person makes them feel seen. Sometimes the person makes them feel like they're fed. Sometimes if a person makes them feel attractive, whatever it is, heard, um, they're chasing a, f- a particular feeling that they are deprived of, either from their marriage or from their childhood. And as a result, they seek it. It's not sexual. People think it's just oh they men love sex men love sex there's some men out there if they really love sex they would just have sex with their wives they haven't had sex with their wives in a long time but they crave novelty or they crave somebody else making them feel a certain way so i don't think it's all sexual i think it's far more psychological and emotional than they think it is and they label it as sex but really it's the new person is get making them feel seen and maybe they felt unseen for a really long time at home Mm. Mm. and i suppose that a lot of single people or escorts are purposefully portraying a version of themselves that Feels. makes that person feel seen. Yeah, the escorts know exactly what they're doing. Same with sugar babies. They know that with this man who's been married for so long, they target married men because they have a, in my experience of what is watching them, what they do is they have a leverage because every time he doesn't pay her, he can say, I'm going to tell your wife. So they really do target married men because they've got that leverage, but also the, the low self-esteem in married men is so easy to manipulate them, giving them a phone call to tell them that they look great, tell them that they smell great, telling them that there's coffee ready. They have haven't heard these phrases in a really long time and that works perfectly with married men but it doesn't work so much with a man who's been on the single scene for so long and has four or five different girls coming over every month or whatever it is so because everybody's fawning over him in the same way yeah so it does, you don't stand out to that guy how much do you think you can change your partner you know we've spoken a lot today about mm-hmm. how things that have maybe happened in their past mm-hmm the way that they see relationships, the frame that they place around this. Maybe it's things from childhood. Maybe it's the way that their past relationship or their past partner treated or mistreated them. Mm -hmm. What have you come to believe about how much you can shift and change who your partner is? I think you can provide them with some level of safety and that level of safety can make them 
a better version of themselves. But what we really have to ask yourself is, why are you selecting people you have to change? The reality is you have to select people and accept them rather than expect them to change. And if you can be with somebody that you expect, if they stayed exactly the same forever would work, by all means, go ahead. But if you feel like you have to change them, you have to then change your expectations. Instead of changing them, just manage your expectations. Expect them to behave this way. And if they change, brilliant. If they don't change, no worries. But expecting to change somebody is setting yourself up for failure. Because you're by default entering a relationship that you know requires work rather than just creating consistency. I looked at this thing earlier on talking about, I guess, the challenges that guys have of, of finding female connection, especially the incel sort of black pill part of the world dreamgf.ai what? so i read this i read this article earlier on it's yeah fascinating apparently ads for ai girlfriends have been all over tiktok instagram and facebook lately replica an ai chatbot originally offering mental health help and emotional support now runs ads for spicy selfies and hot role play eva ai invites users to create their dream companion while dream girlfriend promises a girl that exceeds your wildest desires the app intimate even offers hyper realistic voice calls with your virtual partner this may seem niche and weird but it's a fast growing market all kinds of startups are releasing romantic chatbots available of having explicit conversations and sending sexual photos meanwhile replica alone has been downloaded more than 20 million times and just one snapchat influencer can Karen Marjorie makes $100,000 a week by charging users $1 a minute to chat with the AI version of herself. But it isn't just unrealistic beauty standards that worry me. What's more sinister is the unrealistic emotional standards set by these apps. Eva AI, for example, not only lets you choose the perfect face and body, but customize the perfect personality, offering options like hot, funny, bold, shy, modest, considerate, and smart, strict, rational. Create a girlfriend who is judgment-free, who lets you hang out with your buddies without drama, who laughs at all of your jokes. Control it all the way you want, promises Eva AI. Design a girl who is always on your side, says Replica. How can we compete with that? This article was written by a woman. Mm. Already, women in relationships complain about porn-addicted partners who aren't satisfied with actual intimacy. Now, we're facing a future where guys could get addicted to emotional validation elsewhere, sneaking away for some of that unparalleled devotion. Worse, what about young boys who grow up with this, whose first sexual experience is chatting with AI women who never say no, never argue, never have original thoughts or an identity of their own, and then they try to date a real girl? There's already all of these men on Reddit raving about how their AI girlfriends never argue, complain, or get bored of them, while real girls continually disappoint. If AI girlfriends really do become as pervasive as online porn, what will this mean for girls and young women who feel that they need to compete with this? I would imagine it's no different to the mindset of a rapist. Essentially, what you're doing is dehumanizing the connection of sex. It's you're removing the human component and replacing it with uh, compliancy. Now, the mindset behind that is very similar to a rapist. Essentially, you don't care about the emotions of the person, or even if they have emotions or the trauma or anything like that. You don't need human human connection. You just need your fix. Now, when we normalize stuff like this, and even pornography has done this, we've normalized men to the idea of dehumanizing women for the sake of sexual pleasure and so much so that we are now creating non-humans to have sexual pleasure with um, we are creating a society of rapists that's essentially what we're doing we're normalizing rape and legalizing it but the mindset of not having human connection in order to get sexual gratification is exactly the same so I think it's just the new version of porn I think when we first heard about pornography maybe all the years ago when it started people would have thought oh my god that's a crazy this thing in the planet no way is that going to take off uh, but it's now at the tip of our, phone, uh, our hands on the phone every single day i think this unfortunately is the sad future for our human relationships because there's so many people looking for instant gratification that they would rather go down the re de dehumanizing than long-term gratification of creating connection yeah i i wonder as well it was interesting what that lady said about how it's an, an almost an unrealistic expectation to compete with them on an emotional level. Mm. Some of those things of laughing at their jokes and being on their side yeah. and n not arguing, yeah. uh, that doesn't seem like an unrealistic standard mm -hmm. to me. Being online 24 seven and being able to design your sort of dream girl in terms of the way that mm -hmm. she looks. There is a little bit of me that thinks. Is that unrealistic? 
what it yeah, yeah is it unrealistic to laugh at his jokes I or to, I, to to be intimate with him or to to uh, give him compliments and praise I, I think that is definitely there like you should expect that from your partner your partner should be the person the source of your compliments and praise but the reality is uh, women are hormonal we have a monthly cycle we're not consistent emotionally and as a result there are times where we worship you and there's other times where we don't want to be around you unfortunately that's how nature designed us I'm not saying blaming it all on that but that's the reality of human nature and that's the reality of women now uh, I get it's nicer to have that consistency but it's again it, but nicer and easier isn't better for our mental health we're designed to struggle we're designed to be like hunting gathering to get a girl that's what you're designed to go break like go bravery and hunt gather get a lion bring it back or whatever animal and then a woman will sleep with you now if we're now creating a society of men where all they have to do is download an app to get that woman you're removing masculinity and bravery and and the ability to uh, regulate another person's emotions and understand her kind of uh, behaviors, you're removing that from men. So you're removing their ability to be their full potential and their ability to be masculine because that's not how we're designed. It definitely creates a, a kind of self-fulfilling cycle where guys who have had bad experiences with, with women in one form or another, rejection, or they've got into relationships and they've ended up being on the receiving end of something that's been really bad, will retreat and it seems like they're now going to be able to be serviced. You know, this is, uh, it would surprise me if OnlyFans still exists as a, yeah. a business within the space of five years, because yeah, really, AI you know, will. yeah, well, what, how this would maybe very much be able to take up, mm -hmm. take over if it can become high enough quality. So I understand the dynamic you know, it, this is a safer version mm -hmm. for you in terms of not being betrayed emotionally, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But it does create precisely the lack of eligibility that you already fear in yourself, mm. right? I, I want to be an eligible partner for a woman because mm. I haven't got that. I may turn to this as an alternative. Yeah. It, it would be very, very surprising to me if a man said, I outright from first principles want the AI girlfriend. <laughs> it's usually I would have maybe tried to get the one in the real world, yeah. haven't got it, therefore I retreat into this. So that retreat creates the lack of eligibility. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of this, and the reason that you know women, as quite rightly this lady, it's a really well-written article, mm -hmm. um, this lady that wrote the article makes a great point that this is going to create the dearth of eligible partners that women are already fearful of, yeah. right? So what do you think, let's say that you do have, it's going to happen, it's happening right now. Yeah, gonna... There is going to be some men, right, a non-insignificant minority at the very least, who do retreat into this upgraded version of porn. Yeah. What do you think the female response will be to this? Because that's going to further skew yeah. the market of eligible male partners. What men are hoping for is that then they'll step up. And they'll say, oh, I'm going to be that girl that laughs and does that. But the reality is what men, women mainly will do is step down and think, forget men. Because I can't be bothered to do this. Because, you know, the addiction to pornography has made a lot of women think, oh, God, I don't even want to sleep with men anymore. They, they just want porn. They, they do this wild stuff and blah, blah. So it, it's going to have a counterproductive impact on women. You're thinking that they're going to step up. But the reality is when we feel like the mountain is too high, we don't bother climbing it. So what women will actually do is retreat into there's no point being with a man there i might as well just stay single all my friends are staying single i might as well be uh, bisexual might be lesbian whatever it is they're not going to step up if that's what you're thinking this is what they're going to do they're going to th think step up for who guys that like artificial intelligence that's not motivating me to want to step up that's making me think men are disgusting and so they're less likely to become the woman you want them to be so we're creating a society of incel men but jaded women yeah, yeah. this sort of adversarial nature between the sexes is not good yeah you know, it's not it, good, people are retreating good. into mm. a more comfortable but less fulfilling less risky mm -hmm. uh less content version of life but it's this move away from anything that has to do with risk yeah. is kind of the trend that i'm seeing you know maybe this is downstream from hyper convenience maybe this is downstream from a quasi surveillance state mm -hmm. where all of your information is tracked and held on the internet maybe this is to do with snow plow uh parenting and helicopter yeah. parenting maybe this you know pick whatever it is that's caused this to occur and it's likely to be a ton of different mm -hmm. things congealing together but i don't think that it makes for ultimately a satisfying gratifying life mm -hmm. 
even if you have a life which is devoid of failure and pain and challenge, that doesn't mean that it's one that's full of pleasure and happiness and contentment. Yeah, exactly. And comfort is actually the killer of joy. What they find with people who have depression, it's not that they are um, got the worst circumstances. Sometimes they're just too comfortable. If you take children in Africa that have to go walk to get water, they have no time to be depressed because their life is so uncomfortable that they have a purpose and they get through it and then they get the, the dopamine of getting what they need. Um, too much comfort kills joy because if I can wake up late every single day, Day, I forget the joy of a lion. If I can eat whatever I want, all the junk food in the world, I forget what cheat meal for tastes like. So comfort is not actually going to create any long-term happiness. Happiness comes from discomfort, then problem solving that discomfort and then getting the dopamine reward. So it's a bit of a longer process. Sadia Khan, ladies and gentlemen, where should people go? They want to keep up to date with what you're doing. At Sadia Psychology. And just go on TikTok. I'm everywhere there. Unfortunately, I really apologize, but I seem to be everywhere on TikTok at Sadia Psychology. What else are you doing? What can people expect from you next? I, um, I still have my Patreon where I release exclusive videos that are just for those people who are looking to learn and improve. I also offer one-to-one conversations and one-to-one coaching. I also reply to people on my patrons that have quick questions. So I am very accessible and available at the moment. So I do apologize for being so saturated because I feel like I'm getting a bit sick of my own face but I am available if you should need me for any services Sorry, I appreciate you thank, thank you thank you so much thank you for having me if you enjoyed that episode then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks and don't forget to subscribe